Good morning and welcome to the Elk Grove Unified School District's virtual special board meeting through the Zoom webinar platform. We thank you for joining us and ask for your patience in advance as we navigate this platform for conducting school board meetings. Legislative bodies, including school districts, are now permitted to hold board meetings telephonically or by other electronic means because on March 17th, 2020, the governor issued Executive Order N2920, suspending certain provisions of the California Ralph M. Brown Act. In addition, consistent with the March 19th, 2020, statewide shelter in place order issued by the governor, Executive Order N3320, the Sacramento County Shelter at Home orders issued on March 19, 2020 and April 7, 2020, and the Center for Disease Control Social Distancing Guidelines, which discourage public gatherings, this special board meeting is conducted via the Zoom webinar platform. Public comments can be submitted to the board about items on the special board meeting agenda. Because this is a special board meeting, only comments directly related to an item on the agenda will be read during the appropriate part of the meeting. Individuals with questions or comments on general school district issues may address those at a regularly scheduled board meeting. All electronic public comments that were submitted to the board through the Google platform will be provided to the board. In writing, please be advised that everyone participating via Zoom webinar is muted and all board member votes will be by roll call. Members of the board present today are myself, board clerk Beth Albiani, Board Clerk Crystal Martinez Alir, Board Member Nancy Cheris Espinoza is expected any moment, Board Member Carmine Fortina, <laughs> Board Member, um, I do not see Mr. Perez. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I do not see Mr. Yang. I do not see Mr. Yang either. I know he was, he was having, he was working on making it for the morning and the afternoon session. So I haven't heard from him. Okay, so, um, and then I'm good. Okay, that's everyone. In addition, today's Zoom webinar meeting is being video recorded and will be available on the district's YouTube channel. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, which Mr. Pierce has grace, has volunteered to lead. Thank you. Thank, thank you, President Albiani. If everyone would please stand, salute and pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Hoffman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks again uh, to the board for the flexibility. Uh, we did make an adjustment to the, the date, so we moved this to today instead of Wednesday, and our site leaders um, greatly appreciate uh, uh, that as we wanted to make sure we had everybody on uh, ready to go um, for the uh, for the inauguration day, so I appreciate that very much. Really uh, jam-packed um, uh, calendar and agenda for today. Uh, we get to hear two of our um, regions share this morning, so Laguna region um, and the Valley uh, region, so those are always highlights and I uh, appreciate the board that we ended up putting this uh, process back in place and this is a great opportunity for you to get to engage with our principals that as you know have been uh, doing incredible work in uh, incredible situations um, and we appreciate their work very much and then the afternoon sessions jam-packed as well we jump into some um, some heavy um, issues uh, open enrollment always a board favorite so we're glad to bring that back to back to the board uh, for uh, for consideration uh, we have a 90-minute session, uh, which will go into uh, great detail about the uh, governor's proposal that we received in January, and we will um, dive into the general uh, components of that, but we also give you some very specific data of what it means for Elk Grove Unified, um, and uh, there's some very good news in it, and there's some challenging um, issues that we'll have to work through as well. And then we will work through the last uh, item. We'll be working through the interview process um, for the uh, trustee interviews for area four that we will do on Tuesday, uh, the 26th. We have our four candidates identified. They've been informed uh, and we are excited about um, being able to put that in place. I do want to thank the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Porcina, Mr. Perez, uh, Ms. Chavez Espinoza for, uh, for meeting earlier this week. Uh, they clearly did their homework with regards to reviewing uh, the applications that were submitted 
town. And uh, I think they made a, a fine choice with regards to the four that uh, we're interviewing and very excited to hear uh, what they offer uh, the board moving forward. So looking forward to that process uh, next week. So that's the day, um, Salviani. Thank you. Can we please resend the link to Ms. Chair Espinosa? Um, yes. All right, so regional feeder pattern, pattern presentation from the Laguna region. Um, Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment on this item? You're on mute. I forgot to click both buttons. <laughs> Madam Board President Alviani, there are no public comments related to this item. Okay, thank you. And just for the, um, I don't know, for the, for the knowledge of others, Mr. Fortuna does have an appointment this morning. We rescheduled on him. Oh, and he will be leaving for a period, but then he will be back to join us. So um, thank you very much for, for your flexibility, Mr. Fortuna. I just don't want you to disappear and people think it's weird. So you just disappeared. Oh, there you went. Okay. Um, if we could start, um, Dr. Benny Gr Dr. Grewal and Mr. Murray, if you could introduce the group. Thank you. Thank you, President Albiani, and good morning to the board, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos, and Cabinet. Uh, principals from the Laguna region will be sharing information about distance learning in terms of how it's going, student engagement, student progress, social emotional learning, challenges, and successes. I'll introduce the Laguna principals. Um, when I call your name, if you can please respond so we can see you. Norma Alston at Harry Eddy Middle School. Good morning. Thank you, Norma. Mark Benson, principal at Laguna Creek High. Hi. Thanks, Mark. Michelle Jenkins at Donner Elementary. Good morning. Mary Ann Williams with Earhart Elementary. Good morning. Joe Donovan with Folks Ranch Elementary. Good morning. Peggy Berard with Mary and Mix Elementary. Good morning. And Robin Riley at Joseph Sims Elementary. Good morning. Thank you all. Um, and which one of you are going to go ahead and kick this off? Um, I am. Thank you, Bindi. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Joe Donovan, Principal at Folks Ranch Elementary School. Uh, board President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, uh, Ms. Avalos, our district leadership. I am privileged to open the Laguna Creek Region's presentation with you today. Our region is many things, uh, but before we get started, I'd like to share that we are above all grateful. Uh, we're grateful for our amazing division leadership teams, Bindi and Craig and all our tremendous directors have been our rocks during this unique, these unique times. And it seems very appropriate to lead off with a thank you to them today. Uh, Laguna Creek Regional goals for the 2020-21 school year are centered on IB learner profiles and on the equity and access focus for the foundations of the educational equity strategic plan. Our Laguna Creek region prides ourselves on close collaboration, unity, vision, and resiliency. The connectedness with students and families has always been our top priority. And during these times, we feel blessed to have teachers and staff who know they are the rocks for their students and families. Today, we will each provide a brief overview of distance learning at our sites the real challenges we face, our proud successes, the evidence of student engagement and student progress, and the focus we have on our students' social emotional well-being, and the continued work with our guiding coalitions and our highly functioning PLCs to assist our students on their progression toward grade level standards. We look forward to answering any questions you may have for us today at the end of our time. We're also well aware of our timeframes and we'll be giving each other a text version of the kick under the table if we go over our allotted time but thank you again for this opportunity to speak with you today. It's my pleasure to lead off with Folks Ranch. Ms. Excuse me, excuse me. I'm out. I'm out. I'm I having a difficulty uh, connecting uh, with a Zoom meeting. It 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 locked out two times, three times already this morning at the beginning of this meeting. So I want to let you know that. I'm having technical difficulties with this Zoom meeting, and uh, where's Steve at? <laughs> and anyway, can you yes, hear us right now? What? Can you hear us right now? Well, like I'm saying, it it just went completely off. 
and came back on about, I lost about five, five minutes this last time and it came back up. So this happened three times in a row within uh, this morning. I have that effect on people. <laughs> really? Sorry. All right. I, I can hear well, you perfectly fine. So, and, and hey, we're let me, so, so therefore, if it happens again, so we have what? How many board members? Oh, okay. You could we go. Uh, we're good we have, with the quorum. We have a Thank quorum. You. Yeah, five. We do, Mr. Press. I'm sure Mr. Mate can help you, but one of the things that sometimes helps is to turn your screen off because it uses a bunch of data. I, I don't know. I'll be quiet, Mr. Pr Mate. And, you know better and, than I do. And to use yeah. your Ethernet cord, if you plug that into your laptop, that works out great. What? what? Uh, Ethernet cord, little <laughs> network cord, internet cord. You mean at home? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure oh. if you're at home or not. Yes. Yeah, there could be lots of things at play with it, Mr. Perez. So I'm checking on the back end to see if we can see anything. But the chance, because all of us are pretty stable. So my guess, it has to do something with your connection there at your house right now. But um, let me, I'm checking some things in the back end to see if I can see anything to help out with this. All right, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Donovan. Uh, Mr. Perez, are you okay? We'll go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I was last year, I had the opportunity to speak with you about the culture and climate at Folks Ranch. And I love that I can share with you that the importance of that connection is still going strong with our students and families, especially during this current distance learning format. Uh, our staff has adapted to these drastic changes to what our day-to-day -day interaction with students and families look like, uh, but have kept the focus on celebrating student achievements, providing services and supports for academic growth and resources for social and emotional care and support. Our site focus is ensuring on student, our students and families' connectedness to school and their safety and well being has been front and center in all our efforts this year and been a constant theme in our staff meetings and professional development opportunities. In preparation for distance learning, the Folks Ranch staff organized and ran smooth material pickups, observing all safety protocols, and to date have distributed 673 Chromebooks and 46 hotspots to our TK through sixth grade students to assist in their uninterrupted, uninterrupted access to instruction. Distribution days throughout the year have been successfully organized by grade levels and tracks to maintain safety protocols and have assisted in keeping students connected. Our library tech has run a much appreciated book checkout process that the kids love. And our office staff, myself and our vice principal have become excellent tech troubleshooters for parents experiencing Google Classroom issues or Chromebook problems as they arise. We've also been um, an attentive and empathetic sounding board for parents as they work through a variety of hurdles they may be experiencing, um, and we relish those opportunities to help and assist, support, encourage, and reassure our families during this time. Distance learning attendance rates have been consistently 96%, and we have 95% of our families with at least one parent connected through Parent View. The use of check-in phone calls, school messenger communications, class dojo, remind, and talking points have all been great assets in engaging students and families. Um, our admin visits into the Google Classroom to stay connected with the classes by participating in activities with them and or just observing throughout the week are definite highlights of our day. We miss having kids on campus and that pop into the classroom is, is wonderful. Um, we love our Friday student recognitions where we pop into those classrooms to shout out students um, that have been brought to our attention for, I got a warning already, wow, uh, been brought to our attention for being standouts with our Falcon 5, being respectful, being responsible, being accountable, being kind and making good choices. Another fun way we keep spirits up and students connected with school is through our Friday videos where students can watch and learn about the staff and cheer them on in game show formats. Um, they're subjected to really corny administration jokes, sorry. Um, they get tips from their peers about distance learning strategies and COVID safety precautions and we shout out birthdays and things like that, like we would do in person. Um, but it's a great way to end each week and anything we can do to put a smile on the kids' faces is worthwhile. Teachers are continuing with their grade level uh, PLCs. PLCs meet weekly where they work um, with their created goals for the trimester and analyze their common formative assessments data and plan their small group intervention times um, and their afternoon breakout sessions. Teacher check-in meetings are occurring to discuss students of concern with admin and we are continuing with our MTSS process and our PBIS tier two and three team meetings 
uh, meet twice a month with our MHC behavioralist and psychologist to plan and assign actions to support students in need. Teachers are continuing to expand their learning and broaden their skills to best meet the needs of their students by participating in professional development provided by CPL and our site resources. Uh, we're excited about upcoming work in incorporating the IB learner profiles into our school culture. Um, having students see how it's a seamless connection with our current pyramid of success monthly focus. And um, we're also very excited about the rollout of the framework for high quality instruction the FECI at Folks Ranch. Um, I know I'm running close on time. I would like to conclude with really recognizing this has been challenging times for everyone. Uh, the challenge for our teachers has been enormous. The professionalism, creativity, perseverance, and strength they model on a daily basis for their students makes me proud to be associated with them. While they are experiencing their own personal challenges during these times, they put so much time, energy, compassion, and love into their work. I'm truly in awe of their efforts, and I wanted to shout that out in particular with you today. Um, it's, it's always a great day to be a Falcon, so thank you for letting me share a little bit. And up next, it's my pleasure to introduce Robin Riley of Joseph Sims. Thanks, Joe. So the focus at Sims has been on keeping our Sims traditions of in-person learning alive and well in the distance environment. Our PBIS, our PLCs, culturally responsive practices, Friday assemblies, and our visual and performing arts program. Last spring, Mark Benson presented the characteristics of the IB learning profile at a SIMS staff meeting, and those characteristics were incorporated into our three PBIS rules. Regionally, we decided to incorporate the IB learning profile into our PBIS rules to facilitate a smooth transition to the IB programs at Eddy and Laguna Creek. Our PTO has dedicated themselves to continuing to fund VAPA in distance learning. They pay for a teacher who does virtual art lessons with students over Zoom. Our PLCs have adapted their in-school assessments to the distance and environment and are using those results to plan in-class and grade level intervention groups. Our Friday assemblies continue in the virtual environment as well and include social emotional learning messages. Our staff development for cultural proficiency has continued morning meetings, professional development with Shiraki Holly, and a workshop in December put on by our MHTs on culturally responsive practices. Our student SEL survey from the beginning of the year showed our students had lost confidence in their growth mindset and their self-efficacy. Our PBIS teams gave teachers lessons they could use to boost skills and confidence in this area, and our Friday assembly messages focus on these two skills. In our most recent distance learning survey, maintaining friendships was the biggest concern. Our leadership team and grade level PLCs responded by expanding opportunities for after school play dates, book studies, leadership groups, and increasing opportunities for students to talk before and after school and at recess breaks. Our attendance average is 94.5, which is consistent with our in-person attendance averages. And our efforts to re-engage students and families include weekly phone calls home every Saturday afternoon, Friday assemblies that are posted to the school Facebook page and shown in every class, our PTO hosting community events virtually, like a pumpkin decorating contest, a Christmas lights map, Operation Snowball, and up next, a cutest pet contest. Our tier two PBIS meetings are every two weeks. Referrals for family support through our MHT, district behaviorist, care solace, Zoom conferences, porched visits, and revised IEPs for our students in our PALS program, especially for those with trouble participating in Zoom meetings continue. Our grade level PLC work continues as well with trimester SMART goals. All grade levels met or exceeded 70% of their SMART goals in English language arts and math for the first trimester. Teachers use these assessments to provide small group tutoring in afternoon sessions and LCAP intervention funds are used for off track and extended day groups to timesheet teachers to support those students not reaching the goals. 
Our greatest challenge has been learning and troubleshooting the new technology demands at the same time as delivering high quality instruction to our students virtually. But our greatest success has been the increase in our homeschool partnerships. Our parents can see the quality and character of the fabulous teachers at Sims and being invited into our students' homes has increased our teachers' cultural awareness and appreciation for the parent and grandparent support of our students. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present, and I now hand it off to the principal at Marion Mix Elementary, Peggy Barrett. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Robin. Um, it's a pleasure to speak before the board. Um, I am principal of Marion Mix, home of the Mavericks, where we are committed to building culture, collaboration, and compassion. Our distance learning this year got off to a great start with uh, Chromebook distribution and textbook and material distribution in a safe way where all our teachers participated. We were fortunate that it was a great way for our kids to get to meet the teachers and we continue to have materials distribution to make sure that all our students have access to the materials they need. And um, we are excited to say from our distance learning and LCAP needs survey that 93% of our families are satisfied with the live instruction. 95% thought that our communication was sufficient um, from the school side. And then 92% of our families felt that everyone at our school is doing their best to support their students. Um, the greatest success, like many of my colleagues have said, is the relationships that our teachers have built and how amazing they have been in adapting to this new format. And it's been a pleasure for my admin, uh, my vice principal and I to actually get into classrooms weekly, almost daily, and be able to provide that coaching and that feedback to the teachers and then also be able to get to see our students because they're not here at school. Um, we've also been successful at keeping mix mix, or trying to at least, with our spirit days sponsored by our leadership and our PTO. Um, we've been giving shout outs to kids in the classroom, read alouds, um, our Friday mix ups where we honor and call out our students for being motivated, accountable, vigilant, supportive. And that's also where we incorporate our IB learner profiles where our leadership gives quotes and talks about what it is to be uh, open-minded or uh, kind or knowledgeable. We continue to also have PTO and dining for dollars where our community can get out. We've also been fortunate enough to continue the clubs that have made Mix Mix with our Crest Robotics, Starbase, Running for Red, and our leadership. Um, but of course, we have had challenges, just like everyone else, and our challenges is how do we keep our students engaged, how do we keep focus on our academic success, and how do we ensure that our students have that social and emotional learning support. So to re-engage families, um, our, our teachers are the first line of defense with all the different um, applications that we've talked about, Talking Point, Class Dojo, and they've done an amazing job doing that. Then of course it comes to the office where we make phone calls and do porch visits as well. And we've been fortunate that one of our community members wanted to sponsor something. And so we give monthly attendance reports and she does a special little um, package for four of our students that have shown um, attendance. And to ensure academic success, our teachers can, are committed to their PLC work and meet weekly. They uh, do trimester SMART goals where they create common formative assessments. We look at that throughout. Uh, we have a multi-tiered support system. So we meet uh, twice a year for CAS co-op meetings where we really determine the best areas for um, moving forward. And we have academic intervention, we have after-school tutoring, and then of course we have support in the classroom. For our SEL, uh, we continue to meet with our PBIS Tier 2 team. Uh, we meet twice a week where our mental health therapist is going into classroom and supporting the SEL and uh, mindfulness lessons and does one-on-one -on -one support and small group tutoring. Um, our teachers uh, start with morning meetings and we've also incorporated lunch bunch so that our kids have time to just meet and discuss. And four minutes goes by very quickly. Just a few uh, things of the great things that are going on in Mary Mix. 
and we appreciate all that our teachers are doing to piggyback on what Joe's saying. They've done an amazing job adapting to this. Thank you so much, and I would like to introduce Marianne Williams from John Earhart Elementary. You're on mute, Marianne. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you, Peggy, for that introduction. Um, I am Marianne Williams, principal of John Earhart, and it is my honor to highlight how we are supporting our students and our families. 90% of our families um, indicated on the distance learning survey that they were satisfied with live instruction. I'd also like to share our attendance and student progress data, which has compared, which has improved compared to the first trimester of 2019-2020. Currently, our attendance rate is 97% and 105 students earned honor roll for the first trimester. So far, we've completed more than 50 in-person special ed assessments and 24 are in progress. 90 IEP meetings have also been held virtually this year and several more have already been scheduled out. We continue to focus school-wide on supporting the social emotional needs of our students the fall distance learning survey indicated about a third of our students um, do not feel connected to their classmates. Each day, our teachers begin with a morning check-in, a morning meeting, and end with an optimistic closure. Additionally, more and more teachers are currently using breakout rooms, which allow students time to interact with their peers. Also, several teachers now continue to allow students to remain logged on to Zoom or Google Meet during um, the virtual recess and break time, which allows students to interact with their classmates as well. Our school psychologists will also begin an after school club for our fifth and sixth grade students. This year, we um, reallocated LCAP funds to purchase Seesaw and Pear Deck. We face the problem that many schools have with several intermediate students who prefer to keep their cameras off during um, distance learning. However, one of our greatest success this year is being able to use Pear Deck, which allows the intermediate teachers to create interactive slides, which help teachers quickly determine which students are on task and engaged, which students are struggling with an assignment. Teachers also stay in constant contact with families by holding um, virtual parent teacher conferences, not just during conference week, but throughout distance learning. And also teachers use tools such as talking points and the remind app to stay in constant communication. In addition to making phone calls, my VP and I have conducted uh, porch visits. I'm also proud that 15 teachers have been trained and have conducted a total of 158 virtual bridge home visits so far. That's 158. In November, our school psychologist held a virtual parent self um, self care for parents workshop and we've created a distance learning website called the eagles nest which enable our school community to stay connected as well we also hold zoom dance parties before school twice a month for our students and staff Educational equity is also at the forefront of everything we do. We strive to ensure that um, teachers maintain high expectations for all students and that every student has what they need to be successful. Teachers also work in professional learning communities and focus on the progress of our English language learners, our foster youth, students with disabilities, and our African American students. Our tier two team continue to meet virtually twice a month and we utilize the MTSS process 
for students who need additional academic and social emotional support. However, one of our greatest challenges during distance learning is getting students to return back after lunch for small group instruction. However, we continue to work with families to encourage students and parents to um, receive the additional support that their students, students need. Culturally Responsive Minds SEL curriculum, which includes lessons, activities, and games was also purchased during LCAP. It's a web-based program designed to create a critical social consciousness around topics of equity. It's currently being explored this year by our first and sixth grade teachers. In addition to supporting students and families, we also strive to support our entire staff by making phone calls, conducting personal check-ins with those working on campus, and by con conducting virtual classroom visitations. Additionally, over break, um, my VP and I sent handwritten notes to everyone on our staffs, staff. We also give weekly shout outs in our staff bulletin and we begin our staff meetings with a self care or mindfulness activity. Each week we also select one person randomly to recognize and to give a small token of our appreciation. I am very proud of the work the Earhart team is doing. I look forward to your questions and feedback. However, I'll stop there and turn it over to Mrs. Jenkins, who was my awesome mentor last year and who is the principal of Aletha Donner Elementary School. Thank you, Marianne. Good morning, everyone. Uh, at Aletha Donner, we are the Donner Dolphins and we encourage everyone to catch the wave being wise, accountable, vigilant, and empathetic. We continued our LCAP goals from 2019-20 of academic achievement, educational equity, PBIS, and school community partnerships. According to our LCAP survey, we have 94% of our parents who are satisfied with distance learning, and 73% of those request to remain distance learners for the rest of the school year. 97% of our students are engaged based on attendance, 86% of special education students are regularly in attendance. And in our foster youth, we have 92% attendance, and our homeless is 80% of regular attendance. Efforts to re-engage students and families include admin phone calls and porch visits. 92% of our families have at least one parent connected to Parent View. We have morning announcements. Teachers have reached out through various tools like Class Dojo, Talking Points, and Remind, school-wide use of Talking Points through administration, school messenger, and phone calls. 601 Chromebooks and 45 hotspots have been distributed. Since August of 2020, we've had 114 in-person assessments, preschool through sixth grade. Grade levels participate weekly in their professional learning communities. They all have SMART goals. EL group supports Imagine Learning, measures the students' um, pretest, mid-trimester check-in assessments using cognitive formative assessments, Illuminate, Wonders, Go Math, and Accelerated Reader and Star Literacy. For our SEL activities, Donner has groups run by our mental health therapists. We have both primary and secondary groups. We have Suite 360, which is an SEL curriculum. And we utilize our MTSS forms through our Tier 1, 2, and 3 meetings uh, that meet every other week. With Responsive Classroom, we are working at growing back to school. We use reinforce, reinforcing, reminding, and redirecting language, morning meetings, and professional development coaching guides, creating a welcoming classroom environment, tying empathy to digital responsibility, and seeing the students belong and are significant. Greatest challenges being met are looking at learning loss. We have one-to-one -one daily intervention in grades first through third provided by our contracted yard supervisors and off-track paraeducators. We have small group instruction in the afternoon sessions and are also incorporating the IB learning profiles and continuing our school-wide Arbinger work. 
Our greatest success has been transitioning PBIS into distance learning, where we've adapted our learning expectations and our behavioral expectations. I'd now like to introduce to you Ms. Norma Alston at Harriet Eddy Middle School. Thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. Good morning. It is an honor to be here to share with you the exceptional work that is taking place at Harriet Eddy Middle School. What was initially presented as our greatest challenge, distance learning, has become our greatest opportunity. With a positive mindset, the staff at Harriet Eddy are adapting and overcoming. Technology continues to challenge all of us, but with the help of district-sponsored professional development and the assistance of tech-savvy tweens, teachers forge ahead. Even though engagement during distance learning looks very different from engagement during on-campus instruction, and we do have our challenges with engagement, our attendance rate remains at an average of over 97%. Engagement data is also derived from our students' grades. Both seventh and eighth graders continue to hold the bar high with almost 60% of our population maintaining a 3.0 during distance learning, while we've seen a 14% increase in students who are attaining a 4.0 GPA the past two quarters. To help with engagement, administration makes phone calls home, have delivered essential supplies, and continue to make porch visits to students who are showing poor attendance or low academics. 99% of the time, after a porch visit, students have then shown up in their distance learning classes. Our counseling staff, social worker, school psychologist, and intervention teacher reach out to families via phone calls or independent Zoom meetings. Some of the programs that we have been extremely proud of and continue with the work during distance learning are our PBIS, professional learning communities, and our IB MYP program. Our tier one and tier two PBIS teams continue to meet monthly and MTSS referrals are reviewed to support not only students, but their families in need. Hornet engagement does not just take place in virtual classrooms. Our team continues to go above and beyond by providing donation opportunities to collect food and toiletries for our Laguna community, providing tutoring for our students in all core subjects, to our most challenged populations, and by providing opportunities for club involvement. This just in, our mathletes who just competed yesterday have won first place, securing the fifth first place finish in the past two years. Although distance learning has created a disconnect physically, our Hornet connection fills a social gap. Our teachers will be handwriting postcards for all 1,100 students at Harriet Eddy, showing that every student truly does matter. Furthermore, to support the social emotional needs of our students, KT, or advocacy is now a core class during distance learning and teachers provide direct instruction for 55 minutes in the area of social emotional learning and support. Next week, our school will take part in the Great Kindness Challenge, a worldwide effort to show, give and spread more kindness. We also continue to teach our IB learner profiles and are preparing our students for virtual course selections as incoming Hornets, continuing Hornets, and in collaboration with Laguna Creek High School, soon to be Cardinals. I'm proud to call Eddie home, where staff and students alike continue to be exceptional in spite of hurdles such as worldwide pandemics. Thank you for your time. And now I'd like to introduce the principal at Laguna Creek High School, Mr. Mark Benson. Thank you, Ms. Alston. I appreciate it. Greetings, board members and staff. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Laguna Creek High School continues to make great things possible. Due to the excellent foundation developed last spring, we were well positioned at the start of this year. Our Cardinal staff have worked to better align our distance learning educational experiences to support the attainment of the goals of the graduate profile. We have leveraged technology for efficient, early, and frequent communication with staff, 
students, and families. We appreciate Technology Services and CPL for their responsiveness to enhance and improve our options for digital learning. During our collaborative team time, our staff develop and enhance learning experiences for the virtual environment. Committed to our principles of high quality instruction, our staff have embraced innovation, open-mindedness, and risk-taking to use new methods and tools. An example of these learning opportunities is our GETA virtual field trips. Students had the opportunity to virtually visit Arch Nexus Sacramento, which is the first living certified project in California. Additional field trips are planned, including visiting Tesla and Toyota Hydrogen. Despite the challenges of distance learning, our Cardinals continue to fly high. With 97% daily attendance rate, we realized an increase in students earning a 3.0 GPA with a 15% increase in students earning a 4.0 GPA. Now to transition to student connection and engagement, our Cardinal Support Center, the essential function is to connect students to support improved attendance and class participation. Our Cardinal Connection pro Project is a whole campus implementation in which staff mentor underperforming students. We've identified approximately 100 students that now have a mentor who regularly checks in with the student to provide support. We've conducted porch visits and numerous textbook and material deliveries to our students' homes. Our student produced daily dose video bulletins keeps our students informed and connected. Our PBIS tier one and tier two continue to provide support. We've held small group meetings on anxiety, self-care, distance learning life skills, motivational groups and self-management. We've also offered a number of community meetings to support community connection and communication. For example, we held in October a senior parent night, over 150 attendees. Last night, we held our IB and AP informational night, nearly 130 attendees, and our monthly breakfast with Benson to discuss upcoming events and progress of distance learning. Laguna Creek High School is committed to providing meaningful and rewarding educational experience for all students. And our Student Equity Council has been busy this year. Our hardworking staff advisors and students support this initiative. We've implemented professional learning days and our staff is developing grading for equity book study. Our students produced a video to promote and encourage all students to enroll in honors, IB, and AP courses, and several of our Equity Council students are also part of the Elk Grove Gen Up chapter. Our parent survey data supports the effectiveness of our work. 92% positive response rate to our school connection efforts. 91% positive response rate to our virtual educational experiences and over 90% positive response rate to a communication efforts from all departments. That includes admin, front office, teachers, and counselors. Distance learning has been challenging. The lack of personal contact resulting in engagement challenges that we've heard already. It's also been challenging coordinating programmatic changes resulting from COVID. For example, IB, SAT, AP exam changes and schedules changes in advanced education and college application processes. And we're also completing our mid-year WASC virtual visit in February. Our priorities include high quality instruction in distance learning, but we're also ensuring that we're prepared and ready for a possible return to campus. Despite these challenges, we continue to make great things possible. Our new GETA building is being constructed and our staff has learned new skills that will enhance our students' educational experience. Our Cardinals are dedicated to providing students a meaningful and rewarding educational experience. The Goonie Creek Region is working to provide a cohesive educational program and the IB Learner Profile supports our region's commitment to a calibrated educational experience that nurtures the whole child. And our work with educational equity is emphasized regionally. Your Laguna Creek region has been working hard to provide high quality learning experiences for all of our kids. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much. We love hearing about our schools. Um, 
we do have just gone around in a circle in the past. I think that would work fine. We have almost an hour. We have five mem members. So if you could take, um, ask any questions you need, you would have and leave time for response. If we tried to stick to 15 minutes, I'll warn you at 15 minutes, we can keep it close to a 15 minutes per board member, then um, everybody will have a chance to ask their questions. And then if um, we end up with extra time, we'll be happy to go back around. We have these folks till 1015, so let's not delay. Mr. Perez, I have you first. You're on mute, sir. Testing, one, two, three. There you are. Okay. Uh, I will keep all my questions to dealing with the whole child or student. And so you mentioned principal. <laughs> Where are you at? <laughs> Where are you at? Can't see you. <laughs> Where are you, principal? <laughs> oh, there you go, Benson. <laughs> yes. Uh, you mentioned you had a, a regional uh, collaboration regarding the whole child and networking together. And how often do you meet as a region, elementary, middle school? We meet, we meet often when we can. Um, a lot of like Miss Riley talked about last year before COVID, we set up a schedule in which I would, and Miss Puccioni, who was the MYP coordinator, to go out to the staffs of our feeder schools and teach and go over the IB learner profile with our region with the goal of emphasizing how that learner profile, those 10 characteristics can be woven naturally into the curriculum so that when kids matriculate to Eddie and then Laguna Creek, they'll be familiar with that central idea of those 10 characteristics. So things have changed with, with COVID and we're experiencing new challenges that have hindered some of those goals in meeting with our region consistently um, to continue this work. However, we communicate regularly. Um, we provided posters and curriculum and items to display in all of the classrooms at our regional feeder schools that's aligned with the learner profile. So despite challenges of not able to meet as regularly as we like, we are leveraging the virtual communication to continue that work. Excellent, excellent. So what kind of educational data sets do you get from the elementary or the middle school before they go to high school? I mean, do, is that, do you have enough data, educational data, you know, and talk about those issues of uh, achievement gaps with a particular uh, populace within the community, the student? Yeah, certainly. We receive a variety of data, not only from our original principals, but also from our research and evaluation department who do a top flight job in getting the information that we need. And one thing, it's one thing to get the data on paper, but really what separates our, our region that's important and, and all regions in Elk Grove Unified is the collaboration and connectedness between the different levels. So it's not just that we're getting these 500 kids from this school, it's that we're communicating with our different feeder schools so that we know these the kids that are coming in by name, their needs, so we're able to have a tailored approach to their individual needs. But in terms of data, we get we receive uh, performance data, English, mathematics, that's helped with student placement at the middle level. And we also receive that from Eddie to help our placement with students here. And a quick example, just a few weeks ago, we're already communicating with Eddie's math department so that we're helping with the course selection process that starts next week. So we've already identified and communicated with kids on what we have to offer and what potential math placement students can expect when they become Cardinals next year. Very good, excellent job. So uh, regarding funding, uh, I heard that some of you, you mentioned LCAP, but I was wondering uh, how much of your supplemental and concentration funds do you use or do you use all those funds within the school year and what do you do with them? Anybody want to answer that one? <laughs> I, I can take that one. Um, yes, um, normally there's not um, any problem using all of those funds. Um, mm -hmm. And so this year, um, some of the funds have been redirected. We in the past have had Assist, which is a um, company that 
works with our kids during recess times. So it's a structured recess. Um, and that also uses um, a good amount of those funds. Um, this year, since we don't have kids on campus yet, um, those funds will be used for that if we get when when we get kids back. Um, but we also use it for a lot of the digital technology. So we've used um, those funds for um, accelerated reader. We've used them for Sweet Three Hundred and Sixty, which are all soft, you know, web-based um, curriculum that our teachers use. So does the school site has the discretion to use those funds or do they have to get prior approval and using those supplemental concentration funds at, at the school site? It goes through our school site council. So okay. with, with our parent community and community stakeholders, we develop our, our LCAP and then our LCAP, our school site council then um, approves it or adds to it or, or makes changes and then it's forwarded uh, to our district directors and, and ass assistant superintendents and then ultimately approved by the school board. Okay, very good. I guess when you said changes, I guess you would say that you amend the current L uh, school site uh, LCAP, correct? <laughs> or the, there's a new name for that now, right? No, I believe it's still the LCAP. LCAP? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, no, because of time. Nice work. Nice work. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Perez. Mr. Fortuna? And I just want to make it, I said 15 minutes. I, I, I failed math at that moment. So it's 10. So I'll warn people at 10. And thank you again, Mr. Press. Mr. Fortuna? I thought you were going to tell me it was 20. <laughs> well, good morning, all. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of general questions. Um, so feel free to respond. Um, it was certainly pleasing to hear the many differences amongst your programs, because to me, it shows your responsiveness uh, to your site. Um, and each of you discussed a variety of, of curriculum that you're using. Have you made decisions, and when I say on your own, I mean with staff, but have you made decisions on your own uh, to go with certain curriculums, or have you done that in collaboration with your region? I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, the curriculum that we've developed and the platforms and that we've used has not only been discussed on, our, on a local level as our site, but also in collaboration with CPL. So we had an opportunity uh, to provide feedback and our teachers had an opportunity to provide feedback through steering and program specialists and administrators to identify those programs and platforms that our staff wanted and felt that would be a benefit to distance learning. So through that collaborative process, not only regionally and site-based, but throughout the district, we've been able to work through and add new platforms and, and, and tools to our, our repertoire and our tool belt to be able to implement in the classroom. And, and uh, since you've jumped in there, Mark, to volunteer, <laughs> um, how, how uh, regularly do with, with in terms of the, the other uh, uh, administrators, how often do you discuss who is doing what and how they're doing it? So that, so that each have, have a sense of how you're addressing not just the academical, the academic needs, uh, but the social emotional, the equity things, uh, right. uh, all, all the you know ancillary work that we're doing. Right. We, we regularly check in. And one thing that's unique um, to, to schools is the seasonal nature 
of the educational process. And what I mean by that is we have milestones and things that we do on a regular basis. If it's time for course selection, if it's time to discuss when students are going to be matriculating over, if it's um, opportunities to provide information on our programs that we have, those things happen regularly, distance learning or in person, they're part of our educational culture and community. So like I mentioned before, uh, we're, right now we're going through course selection for our kids at Eddy. And next week our counselors will be visiting the keeping track classes to discuss opportunities that we have uh, at Laguna Creek High School for our feeder schools. Um, and from my prior experience at Harriet Eddy, the same would follow with our feeder schools getting into the spring, getting ready for our incoming seventh graders, the current sixth graders on prepping them um, to become hornets. So communication and that sort of calibration to develop a coordinated approach, it happens on a regular basis. It's naturally or organically woven into what we do as, as site leaders and principals. And um, I'm confident that's consistent throughout our district. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Um, with respect to the, the, the porch visits, and each of you mentioned them, and we've heard heard about them from others. Uh, how regularly would you say that the administrative team that, and when I say administrative team, I, I'm specifically referencing principals and vice principals. How often does the administrative team uh, do porch visits? Uh, and w just just for checking in, you know, hello, how are you doing? And do counselors take part in, in the porch visit program? So I can talk for Sims. So we've probably done 15 porch visits this year. Um, those have all gone through our MTSS process where we've had a family with a specific concern, other technology attendance, um, a social emotional concern. And our MHT has gone with myself or the vice principal to all of the porch visits. I can jump in and answer as well, Ms. Fortuna. Uh, at Folks Ranch, we have only done a handful of them and the majority of those have been to help assist with uh, delivering technology or materials to a family, um, which then coincided with kind of checking in as well. Um, they kind of went hand in hand. Um, our MHT is, um, has not uh, joined us on those, but um, is excellent at reaching out and connecting with families um, over the phone or virtually. And I can um, share as well at Earhart, we've done about 10 um, porch visits and the porch, visit, the porch visits were limited to families that we could not reach by phone or by email. And the porch visits were conducted by um, myself and my vice principal. Uh, uh, Mark and, oh, do, do, do. Mm -hmm. You'll bear with me. Ah, oh, Norma, <laughs> Mark and Norma. How often are your counselors in contact with their students in order to ascertain what it is their students need currently and moving forward? I'll lead off. Our counselors are communicating with students daily. Um, coordinating senior meetings in an early part of the year to help prepare for college application process, getting ready for course selection, check-ins. So the, the counselors have been extremely busy in supporting the SEL attendance and engagement process. And leveraging technology has been an important part of that. When we're working with high school students, they have a higher capacity for technology, connection, mobile phones and, and Zoom or Teams, whatever it is. So we, our counselors are frequently connecting with kids to help them not only academically, like you mentioned, but also part of that connection effort. And our counselors are part of our Cardinal Connection Program, and they have a specific a number of kids that they are mentoring in addition to their check-ins that they frequently do. 
Thank you, Mr. Benson. At Harriet Eddy, our counselors are constantly communicating, just as Mr. Benson indicated with his counselors. Our counselors are continually checking in with students, uh, not only for academics, but teachers also uh, send emails to the counseling department to help bridge the gap when students aren't turning on their cameras, aren't communicating frequently with teachers. Uh, the counseling department will reach out to students and have uh, individual Zoom calls with them, as well as just picking up the phone and making that, that phone call to the parents and or the student. Next week, they are going into our KT classes and speaking with our seventh graders to prepare them for course selection for the eighth grade year, while the Laguna Creek High School counselors will be in meeting with our current eighth graders for course selection to become cardinals. Okay, thank you. Um, back to you, Mark. <laughs> um, you mentioned a number of things at, at Laguna Creek and uh, a, a number of those seemed to me to be enhanced activities which is good uh we always want to see growth in in what's occurring at the school sites and and i'm and certainly not making comparisons but with respect to your ongoing meetings uh with the feeder schools is is that something new or were those previously being held We've conducted regional meetings for years. Not the regional meetings, just when you when you go out with VPs to the elementary schools and um, yeah. Have, right. Yeah, okay. I've I in my role when I was principal of Harry Eddy, I would go out often to the, the feeder schools, not only for formal you know, talk, talk it on IB and having IB meetings, but as a person that lives in the community, um, I would go to a lot of the events as well to, to support that cohesion and, and togetherness of the Laguna region. So that's been part and parcel of our DNA um, for as, as long as I've been in the region for now 15 years. Okay, thank you. And before my wonderful uh, president cuts me off, I have one more question, okay? Hurry up, your time's out. And, and it, goes, it goes to, uh, to Peggy, you mentioned about how Mary Mix is keeping students engaged. Can you give me a handful of ways in which you're doing that? So we were, uh, we've had a STEM focus since the school opened. And so we were able to continue with our cross robotics work and also Starbase. And we also offered Ready for Ret virtually where we have 49 students. Um, so we've been fortunate that luckily I have amazing teachers that can want to continue this work and continue to provide it for us for our students. So our our Crest Robotics usually goes a little bit bigger and we offer it. But this year we're just doing sixth graders and their siblings. And then Starbase reached out to one of our teachers and said, we'd like to really uh, pilot this program virtually. And they wanted to keep it small. So we have 12 sixth graders involved in that. Wonderful, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Porcina. Ms. Paris Espinoza to be followed by Dr. Martina Salir. Thank you, Madam Chair, and apologies to all for being late this morning. I experienced multiple technology failures, um, but I'll try to speed through my questions. Um, let's see, first off, um, I can't remember if it was Mr. Donovan or Ms. Riley who talked about um, incorporating of IB principles. Um, I didn't catch exactly what was being incorporated. So if you could go over that one more time for me, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I think that was me. So there are characteristics of the IB learner profile. There are 10 of them. And so Mr. Benson came out, went through all of those with all of the teachers at a staff meeting, um, gave us the posters and the lessons to go along with them. And then we incorporated them into our three PBIS rules that we use to um, give students rewards and incentives. 
And the idea was that as a region, if we did that, our students, when they matriculated to Eddie and Laguna Creek, would already be aware of what's in the IB learner profile. Um, our fifth and sixth grade classes also infuse those into instruction in ling English language arts because they have had some um, cross articulation with the teachers at Eddy, so that mm. you know that is part of the process as well. Thank you, Miss Riley. The next question is actually for you as well. Um, when you said that all grade levels met their ELA and math goals, what exactly does that mean? Which percentage of the grade level and you know did you disaggregate that what does that mean so well we've been using smart goals for years as part of our professional learning communities and so each grade level using a standard recommended from curricular professional learning as essential in the distance learning environment chose an english language arts standard and a math standard to focus on they do a pretest a mid trimester checkpoint and then a summative assessment and so um, varying from 72% to 85%, but all of our grade levels met 70% of their SMART goals in the first trimester. Got it, I appreciate that, thank you. Okay, moving on, um, uh, all of you, I think, or, or most of you at least, talked about attendance and engagement numbers. Um, and just so I'm clear, the way you're defining that, it means the student um, in, logged in at least for part of the day, correct? Some of you described that, you know, kids wouldn't necessarily come back in the afternoon, but we're still counting them as engaged if they only come in during the morning. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, what adjustments, I mean, can, can any of you give me some examples of some adjustments that you've had to make in the distance learning environment to ensure that you're not penalizing a student for differences in resources, whether that be, um, you know, having a parent sit next to them in the younger grades or um, an ideal learning environment. Can you just talk to me about any, any adjustments that you've had to make to um, I guess, in the name of equity. I'd be glad to address that. Uh, we have had to have numerous discussions um, about offering grace during this time to lots of uh, students and families because of we have students logging in from crowded daycares. We have students um, working really hard to log in in a very busy household. Um, it's offered us uh, opportunities to see into the the day-to-day -day lives of our students and it has been very eye-opening and it is it has really been a step back to realize you know they're here they're trying and working in and around that with them and like i go back to offering grace uh, it has to be something that we all are agreeing to and, and it has been because it has been very eye-opening from the end of last year through this year um it's really changed the way our teachers have connected with their kids. Um, and it's, I think it's been very beneficial to the relationships, even though they're not here in person and we can't wait for that to happen. And when they are back, I do believe our teachers have a, a, better, a better understanding of what their children are going through each day. Can I also add to that? Um, I, I just would like to tell a story about how it takes a village to support our kids. <laughs> Early on, we found out that two of our students were living out of a car. Um, and so we work together, we have champions on our um, campus. And so my office assistant, the students were on IEPs, my special ed, the classroom teacher, we worked together and worked with champions. They were able to give these two students, um, they were able to offer them to come to champions for free. They were able to offer scholarship. The director typically isn't able to offer, you know, the entire family or more than one scholarship. She was able to do that. And so now we have those two students coming daily, being able to get their meals, work through champions and have access to both a uh, regular classroom. They're logging in every single day and then the support with their IEP and RSP teachers. So it's, it's our teachers, it's our office staff, it's, everyone in collaboration supporting our students at need it. That's wonderful, thank you. 
Okay, I will move on to my next question. Um, given all the adjustments that you've had to make in the curriculum and, and other areas, how valuable are the assessments as a tool for educators right now? I mean, many of you, and I appreciate kind of the regularity with which you're still using them, but um, you know, are, are they still valuable as, as a feedback tool for educators? I, th I, th I think they are, and, and here's why. Any assessment data provides uh, a point of knowledge on where our students currently are. So in order to have continuous improvement, we need to know our current status and then identify a desired state. We've, we've heard that before. So even though the distance learning environment has, is different and has affected the way our students learn and our teachers teach, the assessment data from Illuminate and the interim assessment data that we received provides an update on how well we're doing now and how effective our strategies are. And it's not just a, a short term look, right? We are working on this year and what distance learning looks like and we want to be able to immediately adapt to our current environment. And we use that data to do that. And it ties into the, the question you previously asked in a sense that we're receiving this data on, on how our students are doing. What were the things that we were doing in terms of methodology that achieved those goals? And then following the PLC process of action research, what are those things that we could improve on based on that information? Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that it is valuable, not only based on the data itself, but also the cultural practice and the importance of developing the cultural practice of frequently assessing our students and then adjusting our instruction to accommodate their needs. Thank you, Mr. Benson. That actually leads nicely into my next, hopefully last question. Um, so some of you gave uh, student engagement rates. Uh, they appear to be disaggregated. At least one of you mentioned, you know, the engagement rate for homeless students. Do you have those engagement rates disaggregated by ethnicity? Is that something that's available to you all? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Um, it is. We, we can do it through um, American Indian, Asian, African American, Hispanic. So we can disaggregate it. Okay. And uh, I mean, I guess I won't go through all of you in the interest of time, but are folks seeing at any of your sites uh, yeah. notable discrepancies by, by ethnic groups? Um, I, I can tell you with ours, it's from 97 to 93. Okay. So nothing below right. 93. Are, are most folks, is it that close, the, the spread for most folks or is it a little bit wider anywhere else? We're in the same range. Yeah, one or two per percentage points typically. Okay, all right. Yeah, 90, 94. We have okay. one more minute, Ms. Chair. In that case, I will yield my time, Madam Chair. Ooh. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Dr. Martina Salir. So thank you for the presentation of the sites overall in summary, um, make a few comments and then ask a couple questions. Um, I heard an increase in the attendance, it seems like, and then the feedback with some of our parents and families that you're mentioning and students at your school site seem to be adjusting to this um, distance learning. I did have a few questions um, that have been answered by some of my colleagues, but I wanted to explore a couple more a little bit further. Um, one of those being that you mentioned the mental health support provided by the counselors um, can you tell me a little bit more about any small groups um, counseling may be conducting or workshops at your site that may be ongoing to help support the families? That any site can answer. Yeah. Um, at John Earhart, I mentioned um, we held a um, self-care for parents workshop um, at night um, via Zoom. That's one of the workshops that we held and um, our School Psychologist is also hosting a um, after school club for fifth and sixth grade students to kind of support the social emotional needs of that grade of those two grade levels, but also provide opportunities for those students to interact with one another. 
at Folks Ranch, um, I feel like we're very fortunate to work with the Serafian Foundation, um, founded by Karen Serafian, a former teacher actually here at Folks Ranch. Um, it's IO Connect, um, and they work with this go around. They're working with our third through fifth grade families, um, and they connect with them and have fun as they learn uh, tools for wellness, uh, self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, relationship skills, uh, responsible decision-making. And so they meet for an hour, two times a week uh, for this stretch is a period of February and March. And this time through Zoom, um, we were doing that last year in person. Um, but we wrote, this is third through fifth, this section, um, we rotate through a couple of grade levels uh, every few months. My, my other question uh, revolves around um, mentoring. I know at the high school it was mentioned there was like a partnership going on with the mentoring. I was just wondering for the middle school and the sixth grade and elementary grade or fifth or sixth graders, is that occurring as well um, where the students are able to partner up with the mentor to help them um, with the future transition going from sixth grade to middle school? As of right now for fifth and sixth grade, because we are currently in a distance learning model, we have not gotten approval to allow our students to interact with individuals outside of the, outside of the school campus. However, um, my vice principal and I are doing goal setting with our sixth grade students where we meet one-on-one -on -one via Zoom to set some goals for you know, this, this school year. At the middle school level, we currently don't have a student to student mentoring program. However, we do have all of our KT teachers who are taking that time to check in with our students. Our vice principal, Mr. Cormier has been working on a below 2.0 list. And so any of those students who are on the below 2.0 list are um, pointed out to their KT teachers and any other staff member who would want to take a role in that student's academic life here at Harriet Eddy and really encourage them to do whatever it takes to come off of that 2.0 list and that, that success rate is getting higher with each term. Thank you. One of my other questions, um, it was mentioned previously, um, by I believe at Earhart you had mentioned um, the IEP meetings. I was just curious if you can tell me a little bit more about the experience and overall how those seem to be going with some of the families and the feedback from the families as well. The feedback from the families, um, it's been going much better than in-person IEP meetings, basically because um, families have a little bit more flexibility when you're able to meet at, in your home via Zoom versus having to come on campus. So um, the feedback has been great. Um, you know, from both the teachers and from families as well. Is that similar for other sites as well? I would say yes, absolutely. It, it um, I think for several of our parent meetings, um, it's been helpful, the Zoom, because we're able to, they don't have to leave their home to have our meeting. They're able to join via Zoom. So we've had um, we've had a lot of success with that, both with um, SSTs, with IEPs, and also with 504 meetings. So at SIMS, we have 10 PALS classes. And so we do IEP meetings every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, and because the teachers are in their homes and the, oftentimes those parents are sitting with their students, helping them to participate in the learning every day, there's a much stronger connection and communication between them when it comes time for the IEP meeting and talking about the progress of their student. One of my um, last questions is, I know it was mentioned that um, it is a bit challenging to have the student return back um, from the morning session when they go on their lunch break. Um, what are maybe some strategies or helpful tips or resources that you may be um, able to utilize to help get those students to return back from that lunch break? 
I can talk to that. I, I'm sure uh, my colleagues share similar um, scenarios, but yeah, it's a lot of follow up. It's a lot of uh, creativeness on the teacher's part in, in um, you know, getting students back for whether it's uh, a creative or a fun way to end the day that they don't want to miss type of thing that they have set up. Um, we also do a lot of phone calls <laughs> and a lot of, you know, we're on top of them and, and they know if they're not there, they're going to get a call. And so that's been helpful. Thank you overall for the presentation. I appreciate the time and all of you being here. And again, um, keep up the great work that each of you are doing. And I'm always excited to hear about all of the regions and the work that's being done um, with our students and families in order to connect with them, especially during this time of distance learning. I know it's really important and critical for our families to still feel that connection. Thank you. I've timing myself, fellow board members. So um, I have a few questions. I will start with Ms. Williams. Um, you said you're using Seesaw and Seesaw is a new program to me, but I have learned of it from a fellow teacher. Um, I wanted to make sure you knew Prairie is using Seesaw, Patty at Prairie and her, her younger ages. Um, were you aware of that? And could you just speak for a few minutes um, to help everybody know what that is? Thank you. Um, we purchased Seesaw um, with our LCAP funds, but it's my understanding now that the district has purchased a um, district license just recently, but it's a tool that allows um, teachers to create interactive slides, interactive lessons. Um, it's a way for teachers to determine which students are engaged um, during distance learning. So it's teachers love it. Um, in addition to Seesaw, we also purchased Pear Deck, which has not been purchased yet by the district. And Pear, Pear Deck also um, offers teachers the opportunity, for example, a lot of our fifth and sixth grade students, because of their home environment, they don't want to have their cameras on. So it's you know challenging for teachers to know whether the student is actually present. But with Pear Deck, um, students, um, the teachers create a slide with a question and teacher students at home would answer questions by typing in their responses. Um, so teachers can see in real time which students are engaged and teachers can also discreetly provide feedback um, to their students. So both tools, um, online tools have been very helpful in the distance learning um, platform. Great. And one of my things, if you've seen before, is that we have these silos of excellence and you guys come to us and, and you do amazing things. And I go visit a school and I'm like, oh my gosh, all our schools can do this. And I've come to the point where I realize we all can't do all these things, but how, um, Mr. Donovan, how are you sharing what's working for you with your school, within your school, within your region? And, and I'm encouraging you all to push up things that are working to you through districts so they can go district wide. So how are you, are there some formats for you to be able to do that? Uh, well, we, we do, we share, thank you very much. We share a lot within our region uh, just because of the amount of time that we communicate with each other and collaborate and, and spread good things. I mean, all being former teachers, you know, we beg, borrow and steal, we take things and, and we make them to ourselves. You know, I also share things um, when I'm fortunate to have our directors visit. Um, uh, Mr. Fine is uh, excellent at moving things on throughout the district uh, if he finds something hopefully nice at our site that he wants to share with others you know there's a way through that and also through our principal meetings we collaborate um, throughout our our whole team and are you still doing principal meetings like uh, coffee meetings via zoom uh, twice a week twice a week and how are you? How about with parents? Are, are you are you having a bigger show up with parents to do those things because they're virtual? I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Why are you doing principal meetings within our within our elementary ed? Yes, we do those twice weekly. Was that yes. what you were asking? Okay. No, we still haven't gotten there. Though I like all those answers. Ah. So, are you? So when my children were in elementary school, there was a principal coffee clash that parents were invited to come down and see their principal and talk to them. God, those were wonderful times. Do you um, do that <laughs> still? Not twice weekly, no. no. Um, 
Uh, but no, we have, you know, this year we really made ourselves available, made ourselves available in our VP in regards to questions around um, the concurrent model when the, they were having to make those decisions. Um, you know, we, we, had, we did those by grade level for parents to be able to come and talk and ask questions. And those were very highly attended, um, you know, and then through our um, virtual schools like council meetings and LCAP, I mean, and um, ELAC meetings, we have opportunities there for parents coming into, but um, not okay. as scheduled coffee flax like in the past. Okay, Ms. Jenkins, um, how do you find that your teachers are using their after, are you find they're using their afternoon time? Very much so, yes. Uh, they are, they're using um, the afternoon time for WIN, so for EL, um, five days a week, and then also for small group instruction. Um, they also have a support time, so every teacher at every grade level has a half an hour block in the afternoon where they're just there. So the parents can log on and ask questions, kids can log on and ask questions. Um, we, we go in and, you know, check in with them and how's it, do, how's it going and, and how can we um, support you more. Um, and that's every day. Oh, oh that's exciting. Ms. Barron? Um, I guess kind of the same question. How are things going? Are, are you finding your parents are um, reaching out more? Do you have a schedule for that or? Um, not anything formally. I, you know what I did notice and I was just talking with my front office and also my administrator. Our teachers truly are on the front line. And so we're not, our teachers are the problem solvers. And so when there's been an issue, the teachers usually go to it first. I was just uh, kind of thinking and reflecting that I haven't had as many parent concerns coming to me or dealing with that. Um, we did have a recent success with our ELAC. We always had trouble. Our school site council, other meetings are very well attended, but we've had issues with our ELAC. So we started incorporating um, grade level, um, recognizing an EL from every class. And the first one we just did, we did TK through third. It was amazing. We had the best turnout in our ELAC ever. And our teachers came and said something about the student. Our next ELAC meeting, we're going to be honoring students from fourth grade to sixth. And Ms. Riley, just trying to talk to everybody. Um, I can't imagine having those pa all those PALS classes going on. There must be just a, I think of like a hornet's nest of let's try this, let's do this. Yeah, no, absolutely. For each student, it works a little bit differently. Um, it has been phenomenal, the community support for their children. You know, when you walk into those classrooms, for the most part, you're seeing a parent who's sitting there with their child, acting as their, their para. And our paras and teachers have gotten so much better at adapting things over um, Zooms so that those students really are participating and having opportunities to speak because many of them are nonverbal. And it's amazing to watch, you know, like in person class, you'll ask a student, what are you working for? And the pair has had an array of assortments and that is transitioned to the learning environment. So you'll see the kid hold up their stuffed dinosaur, do the task and then have time to go play with the dinosaur. And you see that all happening, you know, in the Zoom meeting. So super, super proud of the efforts there. Well, I just couldn't go without mentioning. I, I imagine that is a huge challenge and I know they've risen to it. So. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask about, um, when we talk about, and I and I don't, anybody could answer this. Any, it's kind of an elementary question though. Um, friends are a true concern and, and young kids are really worried about not having their friends. When they stay on for recess, are we, are teachers staying on? Do we have pairs that can do that time? Or is after school a hangout? Um, I have just a few minutes, but if anybody could offer some of the ways they're handling that, because as a past teacher, there are, you know, you have, you need breaks. So I feel for them just trying to get a little bit of a picture of how that's done. Some of our teachers at Earhart stay on during the break time um, and it allows students to talk during um, 
you know, recess. Some teachers are, you know, zoomed out. So at recess time, they take a break as well. So at, at Earhart, it's about 50, 50, you know, 50% of the teachers will remain on during some of the breaks. And it allows students to just, you know, have a free time of talk. Some teachers play music during break time. So students who wanna stay on and listen to music, they have that option as well. We talked about that too. We looked at our um, one of our survey results and that was one of the things that, that our kids and our families and our, our teachers were saying was really missing. So um, my VP and I are gonna hold lunch bunches weekly and then teachers have started that too. And I just spoke to a teacher yesterday. She said, and that was one of the things that came up that was very successful. A second grade teacher, she said, Peggy, I just let them talk. And it was just the most, the cutest thing. It was just a couple. It was a little reward. She's going to do it every day. Um, so I think just allowing that connection with kids in a supervised area, she said, I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to turn myself off so you can't see me. So you guys can just talk, but I'm here. So that has been the issue that we need to make sure it's supervised but also how do we allow those kids to be able to talk and, and develop those friendships. And, and we've engaged our, our PE teacher. So she goes into um, the classes on a, a weekly schedule um, and meets with the kids and has incorporated a lot of the SEL um, work during that time as well. So she's got kids up and moving, but she's got them interacting. Great. Thank you so much. I, I um, My time has gone off. And I am so thankful for everybody staying on schedule. So um, board members, we do have a few more minutes. We, with, um, did anybody have any additional questions they wanted to ask? Mr. Fortina, I see you first. Anyone else? Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, Joe, you mentioned something that's been, uh, well, it's always been a concern of mine. Uh, and that is uh, that you, you've become aware of living environments uh, through Zoom. And where I want to focus my question, and, and, you, and, and anyone else can respond to uh, besides Joe, we've, we've always been concerned about our uh, homeless children. And Many families are living in a multiple family situation in motel rooms, in condominiums, and, and so on and so forth. Um, what lessons have you been learning with respect to their environments that will help you when we are back to in-person instruction? Um. I can't speak for my colleagues, but I know the lessons that I've learned and that we've talked about within our staff um, is that uh, communication is huge and not asking the questions, not um, digging a little deeper, not just taking the surface answers are things that, you know, we've learned that if we dig a little deeper, we find things that are very, in some cases, disturbing and in some cases are very much um, areas that we would not have known if we didn't dig a little further. And so when we, when we take a, um, I mean, listening to our gut um, is one thing that we're definitely finding is, is, is well worth it because when you dig a little further and you, you continue to ask questions or you, you make the visit to, to help out any way you can, you find some things that obviously they're not going to talk about because of whatever reason. Um, but then, you know, people, families knowing that, we're here to help. We're not judging. We're making uh, resources available to them. Uh, families not knowing that certain resources are available, you know, opening that door through communication. Um, those are things that um, we have found a benefit in this time that I don't know if we would have found out in a regular setting. Um, but that's something moving forward, we're never going to forget. And we're going to continue to dig like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, for, for so many kids, and it's not just uh, homeless, you know, we, we have a lot of kids that live in less than desirable environments. Um, 
in-person instruction is a salvation for them because they're out of their environment. It's right. pretty hard to get a quiet place to uh, study when there are 10 to 15 people living in a condominium yeah. uh, or a townhouse. <laughs> exactly. Uh, coming to school allows those kids that opportunity to, to have the break yes. that they don't otherwise get. So, yeah, though I, I was, I was curious and, 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 and how we, you know, going forward, uh, how that enhances not only our understanding, but our ability to work both with the child and their family. I Thanks agree. Joe. Sure thing. Yeah. No, I also think that that interaction daily with parents in the background and teachers being able to give directions and support in the moment has really increased trusting relationships between our teachers and our families. And we're finding out much more than we would have and parents are sharing with us more when they do need support than, than when we weren't in distance learning. That's, that's really positive. And then if I have another minute, Robin, uh, you, you spoke about one of the one of the things that are near and dear to my heart and I have worked on very hard for the past eight years and that's the VAPA. Uh, and you were talking about the support you received. Can you just spend a couple more minutes on, on uh, that subject? Yeah, no, our PTO has always funded a VAPA teacher and in um, traditional environments, students are doing a performance every um, couple of months and every student gets the chance to participate and our PTO really struggled with um, how to keep funding that in the distance environment because their major fundraisers all involve large in-person groups but they've been super dedicated and committed and doing virtual fundraisers and they have um, continued to keep our VAPA teacher hired and she's going into classrooms every week and doing art lessons because those are the ones that can be done you know, virtually when you can't have your student performance. And I'm, I'm super proud of the effort of our really diligent PTO to uh, manage to come up with ever expanding ways to, to pay for it because it's, it's expensive. Yeah, and it's, and it's really valuable and your kids uh, benefit. And, you know, one of the things we've talked about is, um, uh, Certainly how wonderful it is when, when the PTAs and PTOs are involved, but how terrible it is in, in those schools where the PTOs and the PTAs can't provide that for the kids, so they go without. And, and, and you don't want, you know, we, you certainly don't want to take away from the kids who are fortunate enough, fortunate enough to receive that support. Um, and we need to continue to look at ways of how do we do that with all kids. Yep, so. Could, couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. Ma Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I, I would just want to echo, you know, the comments uh, Mr. Fortuna is making here. And also, Miss Riley, I'm a, I'm a former Sims parent from a long, long time ago. Um, but one of the conversations Are I used to have with my husband apparently, yes, because my <laughs> former Sims, my former Sims child is 22. So, yes. Um, yeah, um, you know, I, I would frequently tell my husband while we were Sims parents, uh, you know, not all schools are like this, right? Um, you know, we were acutely aware of the benefit to the kids of, you know, the VAPA program that existed even then. So I'm, I'm thrilled that, you know, subsequent generations of parents and, and teachers doing grant writing and all of that have been able to maintain that. Um, but, uh, I just, I'm exactly where, where Carmen is. And, and that's what my thinking was when I was a Sims parent that, um, you know, Sims provides a, a great model in that area of really what we should be providing to all students as a district. So I just couldn't agree more with Carmen. All right. Well, um, again, I appreciate all that you are doing in your new and reformed jobs <laughs> and others, other duties as assigned. Um, we are, a very, your children are fortunate to have you. That, that's all I can say. And thank you for supporting our staff. Um, 
Was there anything else you wanted to share with us before you go? All right, well, I think we can take a break. Um, thank you again for making the time for us today and for all the things you're handling at your school sites. We are taking a break and we'll come back at 1030. Thank you, principals. Yeah. Appreciate it very, very much. Take care. Thank you all. Be well.
my friends. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, look at your cool background. <laughs> Very snappy. Representing. I guess. I'm eating chocolate. Mr. Perez? Wow, I just gotta say, I love those backgrounds. <laughs> sharp, sharp. <laughs> Mr. Perez, are you with us? Maybe your camera's off? We'll just give Mr. Perez a moment here and we'll get going. Thank you for all being here. And as it's been noted twice, it's very impressive looking. I show him his in, but uh, camera and microphone off. Okay. There he is. There he is. We didn't want to start without you. We have Ms. a call. <laughs> All right. Ms. Pinkerton, are there any public comments related to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no comments, no public comments related to this item. Excellent. Then I'd like to call on Dr. Grewal and Mr. Murray to get start us started. Thank you, President. Albiani, I have the honor of introducing the Valley team. Um, we have Mike Anderson, principal at Jackman Middle School. Dorothy Stoppelman, principal at Union House Elementary. Katie Hedrick, principal at John Reith Elementary. Good morning. Abelardo Cordova, principal at Leinbach Elementary. Laura Anderson, Prairie Elementary. Mark Hogue, principal at Mac Elementary. Good morning. Richard Gutierrez, principal at Valley High. Good morning. And Alan Williams, principal at Las Flores. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And uh, Mike, I understand you'll be kicking us off. This is true. All right. So um, I'll just start with after 31 and a half years in the Elk Grove Unified School District, I thought that I could safely say that I had seen it all. And then 2020 hit. So I promise I won't make that comment again anytime soon. Um, I believe part of what makes Samuel Jackman such a special place is the amazing team. I have a privilege of working with each day and distance learning has only made that feeling stronger. I'd like to highlight a few areas today that I believe have had the most positive impact during this time. Um, first of all, as a middle school principal that has spent the entire 2021 school year in distance learning, half or 500 of my students have never stepped foot on our campus. That has certainly changed how we do our work uh, although our students' school day looks different, we are still ensuring that our students are getting what they need when they need it. Our PD work through our PLCs has focused on essential power standards that all students need to know. Um, additional supports include a document that we use to track our struggling students. That list currently has 84 students on it, and the supports include relationship building, check-ins, attendance and grade checking, home visits, counseling, social worker support, and many more. We are also providing after-school tutoring for all of our students, in addition to setting up specific tutoring sessions for our EL students. In making sure that Jackman students have all the supplies they need, we have distributed grab-and-go science and art supplies, and it's not uncommon to personally deliver or replace a broken Chromebook, textbooks, or any other student needs. We continue to have our IYT program on our campus, and that promotes getting young men of color to and through college through mentoring, relationship building, and college visits. We are excited that all five of our elementary school feeder programs now have started an AVID program. This will continue to allow us to grow our program. I believe that AVID is so important in middle school uh, helping students transition. Going from seven years of just having one teacher to balancing the work of six different teachers in six different classes um, takes strong organizational skills. Um, that along with note taking and tutorials so that kids can be better prepared for the mini tests and quizzes is exactly what AVID does. Another strength of our AVID program is that the same core of students stay together for two years and I believe that students closely connecting with teachers and other students often determines their success in later years of school. And finally, our AVID program doubled in size this year and the diversity of our program matches the diversity of our school. 
We have worked hard to get our families more engaged. Developing relationships with families whose children only spend two years is always a challenge in middle school. During the 2021 school year, we have completed more than 60 virtual bridge visits and more than 80 in-person porch visits. We are in the fourth year of our Madras Latinas parent group. Watching this group grow and watching them have more purposeful engagement has been one of my career highlights. Our Madras group has become a confident group of supportive parents that now create our agenda for us based on the needs of their children and their families. We are excited to soon be, be opening one of the district's two newcomers welcome centers on our campus. I'm also pleased that to have talking points as a new communi communication tool uh, and early feedback from parents has been very positive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a challenge of working at a middle school will always be to develop relationships with your students and families in two short years, and that is only amplified during distance learning, but that has not prevented us from prioritizing that as a goal and a success. In my 32nd year in Elk Grove and my eighth year at Jackman, I have never been prouder of a group of professionals, the work they have done to make distance learning work for our students and families. Teachers, counselors, admin, and others have done tremendous work making connections with our students as if they were face-to-face -face every day. I would now like to introduce Dorothy Stoppelman, principal at Union House Elementary. Thank you, Mike. So good morning and thank you all for the opportunity to share with you how distance learning is going for us at Union House. Our pioneers have settled into the groove online with our average daily attendance hovering between 95 and 96%. We make daily phone calls to our families to check in not only on attendance, but also to have conversations with them about how things are going. And it's through those conversations that we are building stronger relationships. We are working with our regional attendance coordinator, our district foster youth office, our regional family support center to help us make connections and provide for families that are in need. Our admin team has conducted porch visits this fall, and our teachers have strengthened relationships through the virtual home visit program. I've been so incredibly impressed with the work of our teachers. Their growth in technological skill is just nothing short of phenomenal. Teachers have spent countless hours preparing Google slide decks with interactive slides that are full of links to videos and other web-based materials illustrate grade level concepts. Our students are engaged in you know, all the traditional ways through you know, hand signals and oral responses and whiteboards, but also through newer ways um, using web-based programs such as Kahoot, Nearpod, and Padlet. We've joined the rest of the region this year uh, and become an avid school. All of our fourth through sixth grade teachers, along with our admin team, received professional learning through the online AVID Summer Institute last June. Our team has incorporated AVID strategies into their lessons with a focus on developing organizational skills and note-taking skills. We have plans to provide training for our primary grade teachers this coming summer uh, and then continue to support all of our teachers incorporating AVID strategies into their classrooms. PBIS remains strong at Union House, even in our online world. Instead of a Friday morning assembly in our quad, we end our week with a Friday online dance party over Zoom in which I dance and have fun with our students and staff. Teachers open class each day with morning meeting or an optimistic opening activity to engage students socially. The structure has allowed all of our teachers to check in with each child daily, as well as to build that supportive classroom culture. Our PBIS tier two team meets weekly and we discuss the needs of our students as well as our families, identifying resources and supports for those who are in need. We have provide additional mental health supports and have also connected students with a trusted adult who will check in each day. Our counseling team has been doing small social groups during break times and at lunch. There are also, they are also pushing into classrooms and co-teaching with classroom teachers to provide SEL lessons. A few of our clubs have reconvened such as media club and science club, providing students extracurricular activities online with a faculty advisor. 
I think our greatest successes have been in the connections we've made with students. Teachers have been meeting in small groups to provide differentiated instruction, and that time has allowed them to connect with students in a deeper manner. During office hours, students have been coming back into, into Zoom to get help with work and have also afforded staff that opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of what those needs are. Our challenges continue to be technology and isolation. We um, have provided lots and lots of hotspots to students and help students every day to connect. And although we have provided you know, these uh, resources and we quickly have developed relationships with students in this intimate Zoom manner, it's still very isolating for our students. And they miss their friends and they miss that social interaction that they talk about in that pre-pandemic school, school day. So I thank you for the opportunity to share about how our pioneers are doing. And now we will hear from the principal at John Reith Elementary, Katie Hedrick. Thank you, Dorothy. Hello, my name is Katie Hedrick. I'm the proud and lucky principal of John Reith Elementary. Distance learning has been a challenge and an opportunity for us to grow and expand how we reach and teach our students in new and exciting ways. When we moved into distance learning, the fear of the unknown became very loud and clear. And working at a Title I school already carries huge challenges to close the achievement gap, meeting the social emotional needs of our students, and making sure their basic needs are met every single day. In distance learning, we added barriers with technology, parental support, and motivation that are very hard to control from their home. Our first goal was to band together as a team and a staff to overcome some of these challenges. Once we got over the hurdle of fear, our team was able to start training, planning, and coming together to create a distance learning model that would work for our students. Making sure that each child had access to curriculum, had the necessary technology to work at home, basic supplies, basic training for our parents and food were our initial top priorities. Once we ensured and we continue to ensure on a daily basis that each child has the necessary resources, then we can move on to teaching them online. Our first priority each day is to engage kids and check in on their social emotional health. Our most challenging students, even when they're on campus, are even harder to reach in this model. So we have upped our game and we continuously try to reach these students. We started with virtual home visits, porch visits, and creating a philosophy that each teacher and staff member would make connections and continue to build relationships with our students. Our teachers are using social emotional learning each day. They start with morning writing prompts, meditation, breathing techniques, music, stories, class meetings, and other activities. Each staff member prioritizes the mental health and well being of our students first. Our second priority is continuing our PBIS program virtually. Each day, our school starts with a morning video of announcements from our admin and our student leadership team. We kick off our spirit day for the week, share announcements, share ways to get involved virtually, and read stories that align with our character themes. Our mental health team meet weekly to discuss individual and groups of students who need extra supports in this virtual world. Students can continue to earn bright spots weekly for showing these character traits, and we host monthly assemblies and play games as a school to connect with kids and keep our school culture and climate alive. Our third priority, just like our entire region, is AVID. We are AVID school-wide. We took 21 staff members to AVID Summer Institute this past year, and we have trained our entire staff on using AVID strategies. Our teachers and staff prioritize high-quality instruction using these strong AVID strategies. One of the greatest weaknesses of distance learning is teaching our children how to organize their materials at home. Our AVID team continues to use binders, folders, note-taking strategies, pencil boxes, and other tricks of the trade that help our children get organized for student success in their homes. Our entire school uses iReady to have common math and reading assessments. Our incredibly talented intervention team uses this data to provide extra instruction in the foundational skills that our students are missing. Teams also use this data 
during their PLC planning time each week. We have 37 ACES students on campus each day, and we hope to be up to 50 by the end of the month. We have targeted our high need students, foster, homeless, technology disadvantaged, EL and special ed students. It's great to hear the laughter each day. Last, the true superheroes are our teachers and staff who work their hearts out each day. Last March, it felt like the world stopped turning. Everything we knew changed overnight. Our teachers, staff, custodial workers, food service folks, district office staff, and others rallied together to modify everything they knew to build an incredible instructional model that could be successful for our students. I do not pretend that this is perfect for our students. We know that many are struggling and we have huge hurdles that we jump over each day. But when we each start with a positive mindset and continue to focus on social emotional learning, high quality instruction, building relationships, assessing and building lessons that are based on academic need and seeking creative ways to engage our parents and students virtually, we can continue to move mountains in this distance learning world. Thank you so much. And I am honored to announce our next team member, Mr. Abelardo Cordova. Of course, I had my mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Katie, and good morning to all. As we return from our winter break, I had the opportunity to meet all grade levels to discuss instruction, SEL, school initiatives, supports and materials needed, professional learning needs, and challenges and successes. Embedded in my discussion this morning is information and feedback and insights from our teaching staff. AVID, the Valley Region recognizes that access and preparation for the graduate profile begins at pre-K through sixth grade. As a region, we strongly believe and support our district's mission to have all students be college and career ready. Using AVID strategies around writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading, staff are able to develop common language and implement research-based strategies that will continue through middle and high school. One of the strategies we've had identified at this time is organization, as my colleagues have uh, also pointed out. Students receive explicit instruction on how to use school planners and keep up with assignments and projects. Organizational tools such as e-binders, portfolios, and graphic organizers are also taught to students. We know that having executive functioning skills is critical to our students' continued growth and pathway to college and careers. Students also learn to use technology as a co collaboration tool through chat rooms, conferencing, engaging in rigorous and focused discussion around content, and collectively engaging in research and presentations. Our teams continue to participate in monthly AVID meetings and trainings. Having the AVID program and elementary, in elementary schools provides a strong foundation and springboard for students to continue their path to college and careers within the Valley region. Throughout, through the work of our counselor and MHT, all students receive anti-bullying presentations using the second step curriculum in, during the fall. Students learn definitions and examples to identify bullying and anti-bullying behaviors. Students were also taught about responsible digital citizenship as they navigate through Zoom and Google Classroom. Our school counselors and MH MHT are providing much needed support by checking in regularly with students responding to urgent needs and conducting risk assess assessments as needed. Tier one and tier two meetings are held bi-weekly to review and discuss students in need. To date, 58 students have been referred using the MTSS process. Supports identified includes check-in, check-out, incentives, counseling, SST meetings, and referrals to outside resources. Students who are demonstrating ROAR, being respectful, outstanding, always safe and responsible are recognized each week through our shout out video. Attendance is encouraged by sharing the weekly attendance rate for each grade level. The grade level with the highest rate of attendance are recognized. I remember our last meeting with the board and we discussed the need and importance of SEL training for staff. You heard us. Many thanks to the board, superintendent and all district staff for offering this to our sites. 
We, are, we have prioritized SEL and all teaching staff are participating in the, in the district's SEL training focused on adult self-care, how we talk and respond to students, implicit bias and trauma-informed education. Students are incorporating, teachers are incorporating SEL uh, strategies using SEL read aloud books with themes of SEL. They also begin each day with greetings, check-ins, a five-point scale to see how they're feeling, community circles to share feelings, check-in strat uh, self-check strategies, journal writing, opportunity to talk to pre peers, and in, a, in our FLS classrooms, they are using social stories and facial expressions so students can express themselves. The PBIS team also shared and developed a get to know you form that helps students share information about themselves to the class. Coaches are supporting teachers and with the implement, um, implementation of SEL in the classroom by modeling lessons and strategies. Successes. Teachers are collaborating weekly to discuss SMART goals along with teaching and learning strategies. Paraeducators are doing a phenomenal job working and collaborating with their teachers and working with small groups. We are very, very proud of how they have done their work with, uh, within the classroom. Students that are attending regularly are progressing. They are making progress. However, it is noted that the progress is not as fast as it would be in a regular teaching environment, but the progress is moving towards our goals. Classroom assessments, district assessments, and iReady are used to determine growth and develop SMART goals. Our second diagnostic for iReady is scheduled this month, along with professional development to assist teachers in interpreting data and setting more goals. Parent engagement has increased significant, significantly. Through Zoom, parent meetings have allowed parents to attend meetings and be informed we also have uh, separate meetings in English and Spanish as we are able to present them in Spanish language for our parents. Materials and technology are provided to all students. Any tech problems are immediately addressed to ensure continuous access to learning. Tech services has been very, very responsive to schools and students' needs. We appreciate that. Curriculum and professional learning has secured multi-year digital tools subscriptions to support learning such as Screencastify, Seesaw, and Edpuzzle. Teachers appreciate having these tools to enhance the learning environment. ACES has provided uh, support to two cohorts through the day camp. Students enrolled receive individual assistance and a quiet place to focus on learning. Students also participate in enrichment activities Having the day camp has allowed us to see, to have us has allowed us to see our campus plan in effect, but on a, a smaller scale. We are prepared with procedures, signage, classroom setups, and monitoring of student movement throughout the campus. Challenges have been students who are not engaged in their learning. We are continuing continuously calling parents and student, students. We were doing porch visits at one time. We will go back to that now that the uh, uh, cases are going down and phone calls are made on a regular, regular basis every single day. Teacher, staff, teacher and staff wellness, uh, we keep an eye on that, ensuring staff understand their circle of influence, remaining encouraged by their work and knowing that they have a positive impact on students during this challenging time. Parents who are unable to support their child due to language or lack of technology skills and need to be at work. And students who are experiencing homelessness, instability, too many distractions at home, various siblings in the same space for distance learning has become a challenge. At, at this time, we have 25 students who have been identified as homeless or doubling up. That is all I have time for today, but thank you for the opportunity to share a bit of our school. And I now turn it over to my colleague, Laura Anderson, principal of Prairie Elementary, home of the Panthers. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. And I'd like to share a little bit with you this morning about Prairie. So at Prairie, we focus on connecting with the whole child. And we thrive on our strength at Prairie being um, our connection with the relationship that we have with our students. 
So in the area of PBIS, at Prairie, we start each day in the classroom with the morning meeting. Um, it covers things such as stories, topics, sometimes it's a video or a discussion or even just a daily check-in with students. And it sets the ground for the day so that the teacher and the student can have that check-in with, with each other. We have our virtual Monday morning announcements and our weekly wrap-up that we call Positive Panther Moments. In those videos with our students, we share attendance updates, character education awards. We focus on our character ed themes. We celebrate our students' birthdays. And we also have our monthly rallies that we've been able to transition into a virtual format. And that's led by our student leadership team. We have our spirit days and we continue to have incentives for that participation so that we can continue that um, positive enjoyment for our students. We have also been very proud of the PBIS um, recognition that we have received through the PBIS coalition. We received the community care award for our efforts in continuing to provide the services that we do to our students, families, and our community during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, that has been a true testament to everything that our staff has been doing. So we take pride in, in what we have been able to continue to offer. In the area of wellness, we do utilize the support of our MHT. Our MHT does make weekly visits to the grade levels to provide support to the teachers so that they can get that firsthand knowledge from the teachers, as well as through our MTSS process. Our MHT is running groups with students and seeing students one-on-one. -on -one. We have also been able to provide ACES to our students as well as many of the schools in our region have. We were targeting, we are targeting students who are having difficulty connecting to school. Um, some of those connectivity issues are um, technology reasons, ho the homelessness or transiency of our families, language barrier, the language barrier at times can be an issue and not necessarily the student's language barrier, but it can be the, the family members language barrier who's there to support the child, um, parents that are working, and sometimes even the motivation of the student needs support. So we, we are able to offer ACES at Prairie. We continue our partnership with SAC PD's community outreach. We are a part of their adopt a classroom program. And in October, November, and December, we had all of our fourth grade students participating in the program. And they cover topics such as social media responsibility, 911 safety, positive behavior, stranger danger, and our students really enjoyed that. We are starting the next round of our program next week with all of our fifth grade classes. Um, in addition to those wellness pieces, we support our students academically through our academic intervention teacher who provides intervention for our struggling students. We also are fortunate that we, as a year round school, are able to provide intercession to our students that are off track and those students receive um, additional supports in reading language arts and in math. And finally, in the area of AVID, we, this at Prairie, this is our first year participating in AVID. Um, last year, we started the conversations as a region to really push um, the need for all of our students to be a part of the AVID program so that we can um, send those students on to middle school and high school in their college path. So over the summer, our fifth and sixth grade teachers participated in the Summer Institute through AVID, and the teachers are learning how to utilize the strategies and incorporate that into their instruction. Our goals at Prairie within the AVID program this year are the note-taking and focusing on high-level academic questioning strategies. Um, we settled on those goals because, um, you know, fell to those goals because we felt that that would be um, a good avenue to implement with our students, and it's something that they can apply across all of their content areas. Um, as we continue through distance learning, one of the challenges at Prairie that we have found is um, maintaining the consistency in attendance. Um, we have been able to connect with every single one of our students, and um, that part has been great, but to ensure that those students are connecting every single day because of the many factors that are, are, are part of just the world that they're in, um, the consistency in that attendance is difficult and we work very hard to maintain that. Um, a success we have with that though is the teacher's unique and creative ways to keep the students engaged. 
So once they are attending, you know, the next piece of that is how do we keep them engaged in their education and learning? And so I am very proud to say our teachers have been doing a fabulous job, just like all teachers across the district have been um, in engaging students. So we um, continue to be proud of that work and um, look forward to all of the other things that our students um, are experiencing. And with that, thank you very much. And I pass it on to Mr. Mark Hogue, the proud principal of Charles Mack. Yes, I am. Thank you, Laura. And thanks for that presentation. I wanna thank uh, members of the board and our district leadership for their support. Uh, our community has felt that and uh, we appreciate your interest, especially in Charles Mack. Uh, I'm very honored to uh, work with this staff and with this community. It's a special place to be in the Parkway uh, area. Uh, we started the year uh, a little rocky, emotionally mainly, uh, where our office staff became IT technicians and along with our computer resource teacher, uh, pushing out um, the proper technology and textbooks was a priority along with wellness. Uh, we really took that seriously at the very beginning to make sure that our students felt connected uh, despite the, the fact that they're uh, isolated somewhat at home. Uh, so that's how we began. And as things have gone on, we found that uh, it's a new normal. That is to say, we're not holding our breaths and waiting. We're getting down to work. And so a lot of things are going really well. When I made a list of the successes, I was really impressed, surprised at all the things that are happening. Uh, for example, we have a check-in, check-out program where our administration team, there's three of us, uh, regularly check in with students who have been identified as struggling in some way. Uh, interesting note, many of these students have not been students that I've visited with in the past, though I've been here for five years. Uh, so some of the needs that we've had uh, as far as uh, students uh, have changed um, because of distance learning. Uh, we have, uh, we've added a, a social emotional learning corner is what we call it into our weekly bulletin uh, where teachers have access to uh, lessons and links and instruction <clears throat> so that they can better serve the needs of our uh, social emotional needs of our students. And that's provided by our, our MHT and our counselor every week. Uh, we have uh, um, regular admin visits to the classrooms. We have a schedule where we visit on a regular basis to all the classrooms so we can see what's happening there. Uh, we do some fun things like staff raffles uh, on a regular basis. We have spirit days on a regular basis. Next week is the great kindness challenge where each day uh, there will be a different spirit day and, and a different emphasis on kindness. Uh, so we're excited to end January with that uh, feeling. Uh, our school is very active with home visits uh, up to this point. Uh, recently, of course, it's been the bridge visits. Uh, I've really enjoyed the porch visits. I was very disappointed that we had to cease for a moment uh, doing that. It's been a great connection for me to knock on the door and visit with families on their porch. Um, that ceased other than deliveries where there's no contact recently, but I'm looking forward to that in, um, happening again. Um, ACES Day Camp has been um, vibrant and an important part of what we do here at MAC. Uh, we've invited our homeless families first, our essential worker families and so on, and we've seen great success there. Uh, PBIS is alive and well with our Tier 1 and Tier 2 teams meeting on a regular basis and meeting the needs of those students through uh, the MTSS uh, process and regularly communicating with teachers. Uh, successes, there's been silver linings to distance learning that uh, we don't always hear in the news, but I can tell you with the small group instruction, uh, with the school home connection, we're in everybody's homes, like it or not. And that connection has uh, sometimes been a little challenging, but usually been very positive. Uh, parents have expressed a greater appreciation for teachers and what they do. And likewise, we've had a great appreciation for parents and what they do at home. Um, we, we found that the uh, misbehavior and disruptions are minor and uh, less. The biggest challenges we've had, I think, are the isolation. Uh, even though they're surrounded by students on the screen, they're alone in their bedroom, perhaps. Uh, they, they've also expressed um, that, uh, you know, disengagement is more possible or easier to do now that they're online. They can just turn off their screen. Uh, 
very proud of Mac and thank you for listening. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Richard Gutierrez from Valley High School. Thank you and good morning. Today, I want to highlight three areas focused in preparing and supporting the social, emotional, and academic well-being of all Viking scholars to be college, career, and life ready. You may have noticed that our Valley region has a central focus on providing consistent academic support to our region scholars by enrolling them in avid and in rigorous courses of study, which serves an important social purpose that embeds the program within the broader school community. At Valley, a third of our scholars are part of our AVID program. That is over 400 Viking scholars. Valley High School has the biggest AVID program in the district with 15 sections. One of our biggest focus is to create a classroom environment where our scholars are encouraged to, the learning, to take learning seriously and to challenge themselves to take AP and honors courses. Over the last years, we had an increase of AVID students enrolling in AP and honors. Our AVID teachers are always pushing that notion beyond the school and are always encouraging our scholars to participate in after school programs and to manage their time at home so that they can spend quality time with their family members. This helps our scholars with their social emotional well being. In support of our scholars' career path, our academy, pathways, and programs are stronger every year. Currently, about 1,600 Viking scholars belong to a pathway or program. In addition to our Pathways and Academy, we have two very strong programs like JROTC, the only program in the district in leadership. Due to our focus with our freshman scholars, soon to be an academy, over the last three years, there has been an increase of enrollment in a steady CTE sequence completion over time. In support of our 1300 movement, we have a clear focus to continue increasing the enrollment of our African-American scholars into all of our pathways and academic programs to expand the college going culture. You may have seen or heard that our students are experiencing various social emotional issues. These issues can be homelessness, depression, anger, and self-harm among others. To support these issues and concerns, our social, emotional, and academic learning team, also known as our SEAL team, meets every week to not only review cases of students struggling, but to put a very specific plan to support the unique needs of each scholar. We have been doing porch visits to our most needy scholars, not only to check their well-being, but also to celebrate their commitment for exhibiting one of our strong values, scholarly, trustworthy, respectful, open-minded, noble, and generous. Every Tuesday, our scholars get a video with the strong message of the week during the first period. This video shows our scholars how to exhibit one of our strong values while in distance learning. Our teachers are reinforcing these values by awarding our scholars with Viking Strong tickets. And with these tickets, our scholars could win a Viking reward. We are Viking proud of our Wednesday wellness videos provided not only by our wellness counselor, but also by our ASB scholars. These videos include mindfulness exercises to reduce stress and increase engagement. Further, at every grading period, our scholars are being celebrated through postcards by exhibiting academic success. Last quarter, over 800 scholars became part of our ABC club. Some of our challenges during distance learning are holding our scholars accountable during the off quarter. This has been difficult for our teachers and Matt to manage and also for our students to buy into. Some other additional challenges are maintaining our scholars motivated and not having a consistent attendance from our scholars. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Mr. Alan Williams from uh, Las Flores High School. Thanks, Richard. Hi, thanks for having me, everybody. My name's Alan Williams. I'm the principal at uh, Las Flores High School. And we've just spent the last uh, 30 or 40 minutes listening to all the wonderful things and programs that uh, my colleagues are doing to support their kids. However, despite their best efforts, some students just need an alternative setting. And that's where Las Flores comes into play. Um, what kind of kids come to Las Flores? Well, kids with anxiety issues, kids who need individualized educational experiences, kids who are athletes and do traveling uh, sports, 
kids with physical mental health issues. Kids need physical or flexible scheduling. They have family or home issues that preclude their ability to get to school on a regular basis. That's just a small number of a myriad of reasons why kids come to and flourish in independent study. So let me tell you a little bit about our independent study program. Las Flores is really two programs. Uh, the first program is the virtual academy and the virtual academy serves K-8 population, kindergartners through eighth graders. Um, virtual academy provides an online curriculum for students to complete on their own schedule independently at home with the support of their parents and a teacher that's been assigned to them. Um, they can meet with their teacher on a regular basis to receive academic support and those meetings sometimes are individual in nature or in group settings with other children that are doing independent study. Las Flores, on the other hand, is our 9 through 12 program. Uh, it provides an A through G course of study. Uh, teacher, uh, students come and meet with their teacher on a weekly basis. If they need additional supports throughout the week, they call their teacher. They make a appointment time to receive additional support along the way. Um, so that's independent study in a nutshell. While everybody else has been significantly impacted by COVID-19 and distance learning, I guess you could say that for the most part, Las Flores and Virtual Academy are just doing business as usual. Um, now that's not to say we haven't had our issues uh, with COVID-19, but our basic uh, learning model hasn't changed in any way. Uh, we still provide individualized support for our students. We still provide um, opportunities for them to explore college and career options. Uh, we still conduct PBIS lessons surrounding respect, responsibility, and resilience. But like I said, that doesn't mean we haven't faced our own challenges. Um, COVID-19 has presented us with significant growth in our virtual academy. We've grown over 200% since last year. And I had to hire six new teachers in the first three weeks of school. That was a challenge in and of itself. Um, we've seen the student mental health issues rise significantly, of course, as everybody else has. Um, and one of the disappointing things is we're not seeing as much progress in coursework as we have in the past with kids doing independent study. N not a big surprise, but um, those, are the, those are the challenges that we faced. Now, the same challenges have resulted in our biggest successes, if you ask me. Um, I'm proud of all of our new teachers that I hired this year. They, they had the ability to hit the ground running and thus the school year started out nice and smoothly for Virtual Academy with hardly any bumps in the road along the way. And the kids were able to get started right away. Um, the student engagement efforts that we've put into place have resulted in a significant increase in relationships and partnerships that we've created with our families. Um, one thing that, that we've always worked on with independent study is getting the families involved because the families are primarily the instructional caregivers, if it were, in an independent study, regardless of what grade level they're in. And last but not least, I'm especially proud of our staff because they've gone all in with the social emotional support that they're offering all, offering all of our students. Um, and Last but not least, I don't see him here, but I'd like to throw a little shout out to Don Ross and his team down in Student Support and Health Services. Um, his team has offered a tremendous amount of support to me, my teachers and my students, Foster Youth Services, Homeless Services, MHT, the Care Solace program that he was able to put into place uh, a couple of years ago. All of those programs have been a tremendous benefit to my students because independent study in and of itself is isolating and now add COVID-19 into the mix and it's even more isolating for kids that are fragile, social and emotionally to begin with. So I wanna thank you for your time. This concludes our regional presentation and my colleagues and I are looking forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a little bit more time this time. So, um, 
10, 12 minutes per board member would be great. I'll give you a reminder at 10 and um, we can just get started with letting everyone ask their questions. I'll be honest, I still do not have my screen looking like I think it should, but my kids can do things now, you guys. They are learning stuff. I'm telling you this. They're running meetings and opening screens. It's craziness. <laughs> so, Vianney, just a, just a time check. Uh, we're set to go uh, 11.15 to noon, um, and there's five of you. Um, so I'm thinking in the nine-minute range. Oh, I'm reading the wrong part. I'm reading lunch. Sorry, I'm going until 12.30. That doesn't work. We can have so, lunch with you. That's fine. <laughs> someone bring me lunch. <laughs> <laughs> So um, yes, eight or nine minutes will be great. I'll give you a warning. Um, we're starting in the opposite direction um, with Dr. Martinez Alaire, followed by Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Uh, before you start, yes, who's, who's the fifth board member? Um, probably myself, Martinez Alaire, Cheris Espinoza, Mr. Forchina, Mr. Perez, and Albiani. Oh, I don't see Ms. Chavez. China's there. She's there. Where? She. She right has on a beautiful green, green blouse and her pearls. She's here, Mr. Perez. Uh, You'll be following Mr. Forchina, Mr. Perez, just so you know. Don't worry about it. We'll get to him. Let's start. Dr. Martina Salir, please. There she is. Okay. Can you mute yourself, Mr. Perez, till it's your turn? Thanks. Thank, thank you. So thank you for the presentations. I'm always excited to hear from the region. So I look forward to these um, feedback and the information provided. Um, I have uh, quite a few questions and I'll pose them in the order if any of you may be able to answer some of these. Um, if you can please provide, I know from, I believe it was Mr. Cordova had mentioned some of the equity work that's currently being done or program work at the site. But if any other sites can please provide any updates you might have on some of the work that's currently being done, I'd appreciate it. Well, I'll start. Uh, this is Mara Koch from Charles Mack Elementary. Um, we have a strong uh, belief in equity here at Charles Mack. Our PBIS team was renamed the equity team and we actually put into place the, uh, the um, uh, heritage boards, which were the uh, monthly heritage uh, recognitions that the board passed recently. And uh, we made uh, actual physical boards that hang in the office and we switch those out as they change each month um, to celebrate that. Uh, we have um, a, a high English learner population at Mac, uh, 372 out of 915 students and a uh, large majority of those being Spanish speaking. We have a full-time um, bilingual translator uh, who's here for us, as well as a great, a great resources through the FACE um, department for translations and so forth. Uh, so meeting the needs of each of our, student, of our students um, is really what Charles Mack is all about. Over at Valley, uh, we start about last year. Well, before all of this, what we did is um, I created a equity group with students. Um, so I brought uh, uh, students that represent our school, um, and uh, I will meet. Uh, I used to meet with them once a month, and then uh, now I'm, I have met with them only once a, every quarter. But uh, uh, but I have uh, two advisors that meet with that same group of students. So basically, what we're doing is, that, you know, the you know my purpose of meeting with these students is because they represent our our our, our school, and I wanted to think, I wanted to give them voice. You know what you know what are the things I see on our campus that we need to work on, um, because we have our ASB, uh, and uh, but they always uh, are focused in a different lens. So I wanted to bring something different into our school. So so things that we have. Uh, uh, you know, that we've been doing is kind of, you know, targeting the focus things that they see there are inequities here in our campus. Like, uh, you know, right now what they're currently working, they're working in, in two areas. One is they want to create a, a, um, uh, a, 
a restroom where a, any a, you know any student can get, you know can use uh, that is a, you know uh, available for you know to use that you know for regardless of your sex or, or you know so that you know so they want to open one of those restrooms um, on our campus and make it available although we have some areas that students can, you know you know can use that they are but but they feel that you know that they need we need to have this in a restroom where you know you know everybody's welcome um, and along with you know just literature and uh, we have uh, you know our, our our advisors are working with our groups in looking at literature looking at different things that are happening on our campus uh, we have a Chicano Latino studies class and then we also have a woman's uh, a women's studies class that are part of the of this uh, of this per, um, of this um, group and, and they and we're just looking at different things that will help will help our school kind of move forward in that area thank you I'll add to, I can um, at Union House, um, we in years past we had a, a multicultural committee that was a, a quite active uh, committee of both uh, teachers and parents, and it has transformed into an equity committee um, in distance learning, and has focused on providing um, additional resources to our teachers, um, including. Um, uh, best practices of uh, responsive classroom um, practices and providing teachers um, uh, guidance and as well as um, resources that we have incorporated into our staff meeting time so that they have some additional um, uh, resources to use with their children, different, different uh, ways to have children respond and be actively engaged. Um, they are also providing teachers um, connections to uh, other texts to use in their classrooms so that children are seeing uh, people who look and sound like, like they are and working with um, our librarian to identify books that can be used in, in our classrooms that um, provide a wider, uh, a wider range for, for our students. I can share at um, Prairie as well. Our teachers at Prairie have been part of the implicit bias training. Um, they've also had trainings with our instructional coaches on culturally relevant um, instructional practices as well. So those are things that we look for in our walkthroughs and our conferences with teachers in regards to instruction. Um, at Prairie, we also celebrate the diversity of, of our students in a variety of ways. Um, and in addition, I just feel like as the leader of the school, I set that tone for um, the inclusivity of all our students. So um, as leadership, we have discussions revolving the inclusivity of students and the equitable practices that we have. Um, we talk about things that as a grade level, if one grade level is going to be, um, if one teacher might be ordering something for one class, we're ensuring that that is ordered for all students amongst all the grade levels. Um, the same goes for if one um, teacher of a class um, wants to go on a field trip with that particular class, we ensure that all students in that grade level are um, getting the same experience um, amongst the grade level and across the school. So it's just uh, um, applying that lens to all of our practices practices on our campus. And those are the discussions, again, that, uh, you know, as a principal, we set the tone for as leaders of our school. And we um, set that to the leadership team. Um, and certainly, I have those conversations with our leadership team at Prairie as well. Um, also, um, a number of our teachers at Prairie have um, participated recently in the Welcoming Schools program and took some trainings in that. Uh, we do look forward to the district um, uh, moving forward with that. I think they're in a, um, a um, piloting stage potentially with that program. So, um, and it, that's a great inclusivity program um, that helps us as school sites have that lens at our schools. Thank I would, you. I, I would add that uh, I was fortunate that uh, two of my vice principals were actually on the committee that helped develop uh, some of the equity work. And so that has be, been a routine part of not just our staff meetings, but our leadership team meetings as well, uh, and making sure that um, we have those conversations with our staff. And then in terms of our students, it's sort of, again, what, what they need. So our um, IYT, of course, um, focuses on the equity work of our young men of color. And then we have um, several clubs on our campus, our pride club, our safe club, et cetera, that um, are designed for our students. 
So that leads into my next question. So thank you for all that, the information of the current work and practices. Um, my next question is regarding mentoring um, for the like fifth and sixth graders or the sixth graders who will be transitioning to middle school. What is currently being done to help transition them? I know you mentioned earlier, I think 500 new students on your campus um, of Jackman. So I was just um, wondering what else is currently helping them with that transition via since we're now virtually. Right. So I, a, a lot of that work happens before they ever even step foot on, on our campus, even in, in a normal year. Um, we reach out to the elementary schools every year and meet with uh, teachers, counselors, administration, and get a list of kids who um, potentially could struggle when they get there, um, but also who just meet, might need an extra set of eyes on them. And um, in addition, kids that need um, to be pushed. Um, so that happens before we ever Put a name and a face together with our kids and that list is again we use that to for class placements etc we in a normal year again you know things like our jumpstart program like our night of the nest that welcomes it's a little bit been a little bit more of a, of a challenge uh, this year but again i think we really encourage kids um, to get involved in things like our avid as i said our avid program doubled this year but um, for a lot of our kids um, the clubs and the um, electives are what get them to come to school every day. So we've we have grown our um, our we didn't have an art program when I got to Jackman, and our band program was only two sections. We've added uh, three more sections. We've added choir, percussion, and um, guitar. So we've tried to make uh, Jackman a campus that kids are excited to come to. At Herman Leinbach, we, we have the pleasure of uh, collaborating with Valley High School in our ACES program. So in a normal year, they were collaborating and coming, students were coming into our ACES program, mentoring and helping out with homework and also engaging with them doing activities and enrichment. So we, were, we appreciated that, that very much having that collaboration. Thank you. I'll add in there really quickly. Um, Mike's um, staff came over even when we were shut down in May of last year and they shared the AVID program with all of our sixth grade classrooms. They got kids excited about all of the clubs and the things for middle school. So his team quickly um, stepped up their game and came over and visited the elementary schools before we got them over to Jackman. And they were properly social distanced when they did that. I would also add that um, our special ed team um, meets with uh, Mike's special ed team. Uh, we did that, you know, previously. We will do that again um, in in this virtual world and making connections with um, with all of our special ed children, with their new case manager, and um, we make a point of also having conversations with each of our. Uh, parents and family members of uh, our, our sixth graders who were matriculating to, you know, to Jackman and explaining, you know, helping them to understand the connections that we have. We, you know, we share all these families and we, um, it's not just the, the times of getting ready for the transition, but it's also throughout the school year. If things are going on that affect all of our families, um, we all connect with each other so that we're sharing resources. Thank you for the update. I know how critical that connection is. How am I, Miss Albiani, on time? You're out. Okay. Thank you all for sharing and keep up the good work. <laughs> Ms. Cheris Espinoza, followed by Mr. Fortuna. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, wow, I'm so encouraged hearing such great things. Um, as Miss Albiani said, you know, you can't all do all of the things, but you are certainly being responsive to what is going on in your communities, and that's really wonderful to hear. So um, let's see, I will just take it from the top with questions and comments uh, mixed in. Um, let's see, uh, where to begin? Um, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for uh, bringing more arts and music to Jackman. It's certainly a, a school that has a, a robust uh, amount of supplemental type programs, but you, you found one that was missing and I, I really appreciate you bringing that to the students. Um, Ms. Stoppelman, uh, thank you for sharing about the, the handoff of the special education students. That to me is um, 
the kind of thing that, you know, I would love to see across the district, right? I just contradicted myself. You know, you can't all do all things, but that's one I would love to see across the district. Uh, a special education, EL, other kids in those, in those categories, I would love to see a, a handoff that way as they matriculate from one school to another. Um, let's see, Ms. Hedrick, uh, I really, I, I really sympathize with your challenge of getting those younger students organized. I have a four-year-old that that's one of the things we're working on now. So, you know, God bless you. <laughs> and some others of you also mentioned that very critical skill for succeeding, especially in this distance learning environment. Uh, Mr. Cordova, could you tell me a little bit more? You mentioned that you were doing separate meetings in Spanish and English. What is the nature of those meetings? Just general parent outreach or was that a specific type of meeting? Uh, those meetings are conducted to just check in. First, first of all, in the beginning of the year, we do have parent academies where teachers are presenting, especially in this environment how to really navigate and support their children. We're all gonna have another parent academy as we move forward. But my vice principal and I have uh, parent meetings and the good thing is that we both are fluent in Spanish. So we have the Spanish speaking parent meeting first and then we have the English speaking meeting afterwards. We talk about what's going on with school, how they can continue to support their children but we also listen to them. We wanna find out what is it that you need? How can we support you? And a lot of parents, especially our Spanish speaking parents talk about the language issues, but also technology. They're not really up on technology and understand it. When they call, we walk them through it. We, they under, you know, we do everything so that they can get on to technology before the shutdown, they were coming in and we were doing you know, just demonstrations to them how to get on board, how to support their children. Um, I spend a lot of time just even getting the passwords to some of our parents and, it, and believe me, it, it's, it's great time with the parent because you learn more about them and what, what their real uh, issues are at home, but they are appreciate so much being able to come uh, to uh, communicate with the school in their language and some uh, having people that understand their struggles. Yeah, I, I can certainly relate to that from my own family's personal experience. So I, I really appreciate that you and your vice principal are able to do that. What's the frequency of those parent meetings? We have those monthly. Monthly, okay. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Ms. Anderson, I look forward to hearing future updates on the Welcoming Schools program. That sounds really exciting. Um, let's see, Mr. Hogue, was it you who said you had 372 ELs? Correct. Wow, okay, that is impressive. Um, what kind of outreach do you have to that parent community? Is it primarily through the English Learner Advisory Committee? Uh, that's one way. Uh, we use our school messenger, which translates things automatically into, into f the top four languages uh, so that everybody gets uh, the language that, you know, their primary language in school messenger. Uh, mm -hmm. We use talking points also. That's been very helpful. Our, um, our vice principal, Samantha Moore, is proficient in talking points and uh, has a, has a uh, heart for our English learners. Fortunately, she's at the right place and is doing a great job. Uh, our outreach to, um, to those families who do not speak English as a primary language has been um, aggressive. Okay, good stuff. Um, you brought up a great point about the silver linings of distance learning. And that's something, you know, obviously we're focused on dismantling educational barriers, but it is a thread that we have seen and, and frankly anticipated from the beginning. Um, and I'll just pause here and ask all of you, what are some of the practices that you initiated in response to distance learning that you would like to keep? So uh, some other folks talked about, um, may have been the last panel talked about um, how successful IEP meetings were uh, in this virtual environment, the parents seem to feel more comfortable. So can folks talk a little bit more about what practices you anticipate keeping? And that's for anybody. I'm mute. Okay. 
So I I'd like start. to go ahead. Go ahead. Like I said, it's business as usual here in Las Flores. However, the need to establish partnerships at a higher level with families has really helped us out a lot. And that's something that had been on the back burner, but now you know what? We're seeing such success with it. There's no reason not to keep going further at an even accelerated rate when everybody comes back to school. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, here at Valley, I think, uh, you, know, you know, we have such a success in reaching out to our parents, uh, like parent institutes, like we started, uh, um, well, a couple of years ago, but this year we had uh, PICE, uh, which is Parent Institute for Quality Education uh, for Spanish speaking parents. And we had over 80 parents who, who participated for the whole. And part of what their comments were saying is it's just that it's much easier for them to come home from work and eat and, and then just log in. You know, and, and log into it, and then they, you know, and it's you know because they struggle with going home and then coming back, to coming to school, and because they they have all these you know things at home, and it, with instructionally, I think that you know our teachers have uh, gained a lot of new strategies in in the classroom that uh, before they they were absent, uh, but now because of of distance learning, they you know we have had so many softwares and platforms where our students are being engaged through those platforms. So I think that, you know, that is something that, that, are, that we are also taking. Um, and, and just kind of like the, a different view of wellness as well. You know, I mean, we just it's something that we focus here at Valley has been a lot of wellness. And so we are looking how we are supporting our students via different ways, uh, videos, reaching out uh, uh, and just connecting with students more in that way and, uh, and, and creating groups and individual supports as well. I think for me, it's been um, it's been getting in my truck and driving to folks' houses. Um, in a typical in a typical setting, they they come to us, but I have really enjoyed um, you know meeting our families where they are. Uh, that's been a that's been a plus through this process for me. Sometimes those visits are very quick, and it's handing off a Chromebook. Sometimes it is dropping off a frat because the kid went to all their classes for the week. So we want to keep doing that. I'd like uh, to sign up for that service. We, yeah, well, you have to go to class all week. <laughs> um, and I think the other one is like we, for example, we have um, we have our career day coming up on uh, Monday, and this is our third annual. And getting um, you know forty to fifty people to commit to coming to a school site for a day is a challenge. But in this world, they can do a career day from their uh, place of work. And so we're really excited to see how it goes on Monday and whether it's something we want to continue or um, you know, go back to our old. So I'll let you know. Yeah, I participated in a career day actually for um, one of my cousins who teaches in San Bernardino County. They used, uh, I, I'll look for the app and send it to you guys, but they used an app and had everybody record their own presentation and apparently they were able to, to pull that together. So I hear I that, that one. Thank you. Nancy, if you can wrap up, please. Yeah, just, just continuing the same question. If anybody else has anything else that they want to share that they plan to keep. I'll add in, um, going off what Richard shared, we were able to host the Latino Literacy Project for the Valley Region. And we got a ton of parents that logged in every week for those uh, mini lessons. We got books into students' hands. So we had a great turnout virtually for parents. Um, so some of these virtual ways that we're connecting with parents is going to be something that we all want to keep. Um, we're also able to record things like back to school night, parent universities, um, ELAC meetings, those kind of things where if people miss it, they can watch it at their own time and then they didn't miss it. So they can still be a part of that school culture um, depending on their schedule and their availability. So a lot of the parent connections will continue to keep. All good things. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Chair Espinoza. Mr. Forchina? I will be right with you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to tell everyone in the Valley region, I, I love the fact that you had uh, the same background because that to me, shows your unity of, of your region. And I think ju just, just that visual to me says a whole lot about your region. Um, also uh, common in your presentations uh, is that I really believe that you're in tune 
with family and student need. And to me, it, it came out very, very, very strong. Uh, Michael, um, we've had a number of conversations in the past about all the good work that you and your staff do and how frustrating it is when it's time for families to go over to Valley. Um, have you been seeing a positive uh, uh, movement on the part of parents to go to Valley as, as opposed to looking at different options? Um, so I think, uh, I think Richard could confirm that, but I think his enrollment has been going up um, each year for the last few years. And that is something that Mr. Madison challenged me with when I got hired at Jackman um, almost eight years ago. And the assumption was among our communities as our, that our elementary schools were this amazing places for their children to attend. And then when they went to middle school, it all broke loose. Um, and then when they went to Valley, there was another breaking loose of where, where are all these, you know, horrible kids coming from when in fact they're just coming from their elementary schools and they're fabulous kids. And so I think we have done a lot of um, uh, a PR of making Jackman be a place that people want to attend. And then our work when they're there is to tell them how amazing Valley is and that these are our kids going to Valley. There's not another middle school feeding into Valley. It's our kids. And if you love Jackman, you'll love Valley even more. So I think we have done a lot of PR with that and, and you know, enjoy working with Richard and his team over there. Yes, I agree. Um, Thank you. Um, Katie, um, you talked about the challenges of parent support motivation technology. Uh, and you also made a comment about the fact that parents need to work. And we know that in a lot of communities, that one issue uh, is, has always been an issue with in-person instruction and, and it becomes in many ways a bigger issue with distance learning because they're not there to do the support piece. Uh, so that being said, do you personally see differences with DL and in-person learning versus that parent support? Yeah, I remember the first few months, um, I think in all of my K through two families and probably my colleagues as well, we would, I would jump into classrooms and I see a parent sitting right next to a child and they're like helping them navigate. Um, so the parent support right now has been astronomical. I mean, these parents are going above and beyond to try to help their support their child, work at home, uh, still, you know, keep everything, you know, five or six kids in different areas of the house. So the parental support has been um, overwhelming. Um, so we've done a ton, like we've tried to strategically map like uh, parent coffee um, chats. I've done them at 730 in the morning when the kids aren't on their Chromebooks so they can use those Chromebooks as well. We didn't get a huge turnout. So I moved it to 230, but that's after school hours. So we had you know, 25 parents show up. Um, and then I do evening meetings for parents about 6, 630. And I had like 115 show up. So I just try to mix it up um, and meet my families where they are so that I can help support and keep that uh, parental engagement going as long as we can. And just like my colleagues, we use messenger, we use talking points, we do daily or if not weekly phone calls. Um, so we are trying to reach them on every level and support them as much as we can, but they've been a huge asset to us in this virtual world too. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, moving on to Abelardo. Um, you, you mentioned the things that are going on with your tier one and tier two kids um, and, and the biweekly meetings. What are the characteristics that are common amongst the kids? Some of the characteristics that we're finding with students is just, um, you know, the flip side where we do have some parents who are very engaged and supportive. We also have families that are struggling through this pandemic in many, many ways, whether it's health, wellness, 
uh, financial um, or just uh, having family members who have been impacted by this. We have children who are living apart from their families and living with grandparents or a, another person that is caring for them because parents are uh, have to go different places to go to work. There has been such a, uh, an upheaval with some of the students and their placement and where they're going. Um, we have, again, that homeless piece and students doubling up that has uh, impacted our students. So it's, it's, it's uh, something that we continuously work on. Our health, our MHT and our counselor, we go through all the names of all the students. We continuously look at where we are with progressing with them, motivating them, supporting them. Uh, we get lots of great support from the district as well, from the Office of um, Attendance. So this was very, very helpful. We have been communicating with the parent over and over and over to get her parent, her child logged in. We provided all the resources. And once the district office contacted the parent, we saw the student right away in class. So that was very, very helpful. That was tremendous support, but it's that collaboration once again that we have in order to support the students and the families. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, we worked hard on with respect to Office of Attendance and, and really pleased that it's having a positive uh, effect throughout the entire school district. So thank you. Uh, real quick, uh, Laura, I don't, I don't have a question because uh, I'm running out of time. I just wanna say to you, I uh, really appreciated the comment you made uh, when you said that as a leader, I set the tone because that's where everyone needs to be. Um, oh, Abelardo, I did have another question. Um, you highlighted the work of the paraeducators. Yes. Which I, I think was, was very, very nice because um, I do believe that they are uh, sort of forgotten in the process when people talk about what's going on. Uh, when we resume, um, to back to in-person instruction, do you think you'll be able to use them in a similar way that you've been using them with distance learning? Yes, I think what, what has happened, and again, the silver lining with all of this is that everybody, the, first of all, the paras have done a tremendous job learning the technology in a fast, fast pace. So they, at the beginning of the year, we were moving with them and learning the, all the te technological pieces of that. And it was just tremendous. They love engaging with the students and we can now help to engage other students that way too. Continuing some of that um, process when we come back to school, but the, the, that technology piece has made a different level of connection with students. So we, we're just very proud of the work. When I hear it, and I don't have to, go virtually, I go to the classroom because the paras are working in the classroom and I can see them and they're so fully engaged with their groups. Right. Thank you. Um, can you finish up please, Mr. Fertino? That's what I'm gonna do. And I was just gonna make a comment, Mark and Richard, I'm not ignoring you, but I knew that Beth was gonna be on me. Uh, Alan, <laughs> quickly, um, do, you, do you see any, any value uh, into looking at increasing virtual academy to be K-12 instead of K-8? I do, I have many families in my K-8 program asking about nine through 12. And <clears throat> while it's not exactly the same, they're quite similar. And after talking to the families, generally they move into Las Flores nine through 12 program. But um, you know, as far as having a single K-12 program, there's arguments for and against it, but uh, as long as a, as long as they're combined in a way that families feel that it's a smooth transition from one to the other, uh, I think that that's good enough. Would would you have the numbers to justify K twelve? Right now we do. I mean, if if I if I can keep if I can keep even two thirds of the families that came to me. Uh, in the last year, that would be that would be enough to justify expanding it nine through twelve. And are there any barriers to doing that? Uh, 
No, just a couple of uh, curriculum uh, approval uh, barriers that I'm already working on. Then I guess the last question, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do we need to pursue it? I'm pursuing it myself right now. Very good. Thank you. Great question, Mr. Porcina. Thank you. Um, Mr. Perez? Well, you stole my question. I support your program 100%. We should district, we should have a program like yours, all district wide, you know, both, you know, virtual and uh, <laughs> what's the other one you have? <laughs> Independent study. Right, exactly. Because we, uh, because uh, right now, we, I, I see all these uh, commercials on TV. I don't, we need to compete with them. We need that uh, ADA and we have the best teachers to do it. So I support you 100%. And as long as we uh, get four votes on this board, we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, how's that? Now you, got my vote. You, you have my vote. Well, when I took over, I was astounded at the number of online programs mm -hmm. and there's just increasing dramatically over the last five years. Exactly. That's the trend. You know, you know, this epidemic is going to change education, I believe, you know, uh, virtual, uh, virtual reality classes. <laughs> you don't have to go on college you get those glasses on you be there. You don't have hey, to uh, go to the Alps, you know. Well, you, you, you just bring them on. I'm ready. All right. Well, I, like I tell these other board members, you know, I'm for students first <laughs> and we need student services first. Okay. Okay. You're going to start my time. I started uh, your time, minutes. Mr. Perez. You've been talking. Go ahead. Well, I, I'll start at that 5, uh, 1152, okay. 10 minutes. All right. Um, Nine minutes, and thank you for taking my time. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, let's go first here. A um, lot of questions. Mr. Anderson, how many students do you have over there tutoring after school? We have quite a few. I can't give you an exact number, but like I said, we have we have a program that is run. Our our teachers run after school uh, tutoring program. We also have uh, students from Sac State that we've had that program going on our campus for I believe four years now, mm -hmm. and we have our uh, program that is designed specifically for for our EL kids. So it fluctuates depending on the day and the time of the quarter. Short questions, because I got a lot of questions, please. <laughs> Short answers. Okay. Okay, you have a young man of color. Where's the funding from? It comes from uh, you all. It's for, it's for IYT program. You pay for that. The AVID Court. Uh, you mentioned you had an AVID Court program, um, but you said it was a core, a core uh, students. To me, I don't support a core of students. I think it should be uh, school-wise because that's like the tracking system we had back in the 50s. You know, this, this, this core Advent program should be like the other elementary schools there and other schools. I, per, I prefer a school-wise Advent program, not just a core academy type. Uh, to me, you're leaving out a lot of students. Uh, Okay, uh, Bridges, what's Bridges? And oh, I like the fact that you have a Latino mothers a program. I'm an advocate for that. I'm an advocate for PICO. I think every every uh, site that you have in this Valley High School region should have a PICO program, student, uh, parent engagement. It's one of the best programs in the state of California. I'm very familiar. I worked with them, this and that. They, they're very progressive and they empower our parents to get involved in schools. That's what we need to you know, get involved with students and training of our mothers. They say you train a mother, you train the whole family. And through IT, that's the way to go. Thank you. Uh, union Health, Advent, mental health uh, support. I'm glad you're doing that. Uh, classroom curriculum, culture. Yeah, you, we need to get more culture in the class, you know. Uh, that's why I support affirmative action. Staff should be reflective of the community. And when they see faces like theirs, that, that this has been proven that they have better outcomes. And there's a language issue in this area. 
It's a language issue in my area, region uh, one over here at uh, Florence. We need more bilingual, bicultural uh, staffing to get involved with our community. They feel more happy. They look like you, you know, and, and I'm not advocating, uh, you know, get rid of you people, but, you know, we need bilingual, bicultural teacher aides in your crew, in your classroom. That's what I support, you know, because of the fact that there's a language cultural barrier, you know, in, in our schools. So time will tell. Uh, title one. Now, all of you are title one schools, correct? Yes, I imagine so. Right. Valley High is a low income area, just like uh, Florida High School. So we are going to get money very shortly through our federal programs. Our new president, I've been reading his programs, look forward to that new funding packages. So uh, keep up the good work with your Title I programs. Uh, Let me get back over here. Four pages of notes. <laughs> and because of that, I will not ask all the questions. I think there's a big issue of data. Data, you know, I'm, you know, we should have data of your region. We used to get data of reports, you know, through our other administrators, superintendent. We need data of district and trend studies, how each student is growing, how each classroom production outcomes is growing. And when we have these reports, we can see data. I know you're doing a good job doing, you know, with your students, but we need data to prove that, to, to show that PICO is improving outcomes, uh, to show that your new approach of you know, doing home uh, contacts, porch things, is having outcomes through your uh, participation in the community. I know that for a fact. When you go to people's houses and knocking on the door, you, hey, they, they, they're, that's serious. <laughs> and they, they, fear, they fear that you have the authority to call the law on them and you have more outcomes, more ADA in our school system. I'm glad you do that. And also I was wondering who has the data set of when you reach or call the office of attendance? Okay, what time do you call the, how many times do you call uh, the office attendant after four absences, after six absences. We don't know that. I don't know that for a fact. And after the fact, I believe that if they miss two right away, somebody should be knocking on their door and saying, hey, get online right now. We, you cannot afford to lose, you know, learning loss, achievement gap and all that be compounded. So we need to be knocking on doors after two absences or one absence Say, what's going on? We need to get to, I'm glad, and you guys are doing that. I've seen that. I'm very uh, appreciative and uh, happy that you guys are doing that. And you're a unique staff that been around a long time and you, you know, you're working hard. I know that. I see that, I hear that even from the parents <laughs> when I go to the grocery store in that area on Center Parkway. I call it, uh, the, what did I call it? Uh, Killer's Alley. <laughs> very, be careful in that area, by the way. Be very careful in that area. Center Parkway Street. Oh, let's see here. Let's see. Here. So, and uh, Oh, what's this one over here? Mac? Hey, I think there should be a newcomer center there. We need to fund you full time a newcomer center because I always knew that and I've kept up with the data that at Mac Elementary and a lot of your elementary, there should be a newcomer center language institute at those things. You know, we, we have one bilingual staff to deal with all your regions. That's silly. That is silly. We need a bilingual cultural <laughs> at each one of your schools to help those teachers, your staff, and everybody to call up these people and or teacher aides at least or bilingual bicultural. So anyway, I'm gonna stop at that because of the fact it gets my high blood pressure up. <laughs> Thank you, and, Mr. Uh, Perez. And uh, keep up the good work, uh, you know. You know, I got involved with this. You, you know, I'm an educator, but you know, I was in politics 
for a while, then I got right. ran for the school board. I'll let you know, because of Prop 30, I want more monies in the classroom to support you in the classroom, at the classroom level. I need more services to students. And, and you know, it's not happening as fast as I like it to, but it's okay. happening. Thank you. Thank you, you Mr. Perez. Um, Mr. Anderson, your um, Madras Latino group, I'm very excited as well, like Mr. Perez. If you could mute yourself when you get a chance, Mr. Perez. Um, do you also have a BSU? We, we do. Um, it's it not been as successful um, as I wish it was. I, we've Richard uh, Gutierrez and I have talked about working with Valley High and their BSU. Um, it, just, uh, it hasn't, for whatever reason, been um, something that our kids have been as excited about. And we've tried to run them before and they're not always well attended. Um, okay. So again, I need to re reach out to Richard and, and work with him on that. Okay, and can I also suggest, I know Albiani has a newly formed um, BSU group and um, Laguna Creeks Junior High, I'm blanking, um, all have pretty, very active BSUs, which might be a way to, to um, in this virtual world of isolation, to get some growth in your group and, and see some things they can do. So Thank you. if I can recommend that and encourage you with that. Um, what do you do to reach down and start relationships in elementary? Because I, when my kids went through junior high, I just felt it. Like you only have them two years. It's like a flash and they're gone. And to, to build that relationship is hard. So I think part of it is our, you know, our, our families are K-12. And so yeah. even though we only have our kids for two years, we, you know, I get to meet their younger siblings when they come into the office, et cetera. I think, um, Again, we, we have done so much outreach to our elementary schools prior to the kids ever getting there. And as it has been mentioned, it's everything from my administrators to my counselors, to my AVID coordinators, to my special ed folks reaching out there. So we kind of get a picture of these kids before they ever come, come on our campus. If we let it just happen naturally, we'll be halfway through you know, the year before you can put a name and a face together. And, and you know, we're already a fourth of the way through. So it really becomes important for us to, to you know, build those relationships with our kids and our families as quickly as possible. Thanks. Ms. Hendrick, you mentioned ACEs happening on your, your campus. And as we keep talking and planning for children to come back, there I have heard concerns of them being able to follow the rules and wear masks, and do the things they're asked to do. Um, could you enlighten us to your experience with those? Yeah, so something our PBIS team started was um, in planning for students returning, um, we're able to use the student, the ACES kids, to kind of be our guinea pigs as we um, make videos and things. So we made like a bathroom video and we're working on a playground video to teach them how to safely follow the rules um, because they're kids. They come back and they start immediately like wanting to hang out with their friends and hug their teachers. And I mean, these common things of that children do and that adults as well when we work as educators. Um, so we have like strategically planned out little steps where students stand outside classrooms and we practice, especially with the little ones. Um, each classroom is set up with masks and hand sanitizer and extras. We pass them out to the students because every day they forget them. Um, mm -hmm. So these are common threads um, and it's just teaching and training um, and trying to get the kids to understand how important it is to keep everyone safe. Um, we want to love on you and we want to take care of you and we want to meet your academic needs, but we want everybody safe first. Um, and so it's just a lot of training and practice and we've done it at recess. So that gives us a good opportunity to really get out there. We walk the track together and we're able to have those conversations about keeping our masks on and making sure we're careful when we're playing games and how we safely play on the play structure. So all of those things take a lot of practice and training of our students. I think the idea of a video is fantastic too. I think uh, uh, some, seeing something transcends reading uh, something for, for so many people so. and memory. Ms. Suppleman, what, um, when you have your assemblies on the, how is your attendance and do you do those after school that you get them back after lunch because they want to come, correct? Um, we actually open our day on Friday morning before oh. school. So I get them before school so I can get them to class on time. That was, <laughs> That was a request by my teachers is to do it, to do it early. So we do it at 745. 
um, for a few minutes. I also get families, which is what I did when I did my uh, assemblies in the quad, because you know families would bring their kids to school and then they'd stay in the quad. So now families come into the Zoom and dance. I love it. And it's so cute and it's fun. It's fun yeah. and we all could use a little more fun. Ms. Anderson, you're talking about having intercession, uh, which many of you I'm sure are, but uh, how is your attendance in that? Have you found that to be good as yes. normal or better than normal? Um, it's pretty normal as what it's been in the past. We've ran intercession before January. This is our first cycle of intercession. Um, so we had, uh, where did my intercession know? Um, 31 students. And I just, um, it just ended yesterday for our C-Track students. So um, that was kindergarten through sixth grade. So, and that's pretty typical of um, the number of students that may attend intercession. Great. Um, and then, do, Mr. Hogue, do you meet as a, as a regent? Uh, no, you mean as teach, as uh, principals? Mm -hmm. uh, no, not regularly. We don't have anything on the books, but we, we communicate regularly. Uh, we have a really tight region uh, that we share all the time. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, as you said, you, 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 you appear so very unified. And I think the exciting movement of AVID in your region is a win for your, for your, for your students, your scholars, and, and sets them up for a lifetime of success. Ms. Albion, if I could say, I, I think that what, what we lack in our, our regularly scheduled monthly meetings is offset by the fact that we, we talk all the time and it, it is not uncommon for us to go less than a week without talking to someone from the school about a family that we found some information out about. So our, our meetings are often, they're just not uh, formally on a calendar. I, I, I understand and sound very, very productive. We have gone over your time. I appreciate all your time this morning. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing with us. You, um, you are there for our families and, and we appreciate the way you support our teachers and our families and our students so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you for the opportunity for having us. Stronger Thank together. You. Thank you, principals. Appreciate it very, very much. 100%. Be well. Um, so now we'll take a lunch break until 1230, unless you had anything else, Mr. Hoffman? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. See you at 1230.
Sorry, the cafe was closed, Beth. I got a menu that said they were open, but I, I never eat lunch. You don't even eat. Why do I listen to you? you don't yeah, eat. I know. Yeah, just uh, I'm good for I'm good for some things, but that's not one of them. No, no, that's okay. That's your biggest failure. We're all doing good. You had kid delivery. Kid delivery. My children are in school. <laughs> <laughs> One of them's tutoring the neighbor's kid. Yeah, that's what Allie's doing too, is tutoring. He's a funny little guy. He comes over. He's the youngest of like four, four, four. Yeah. So Dennis and I feel for him being the youngest. So he comes over at our house and helps me cook and stuff. And mom's like, hey, somebody over there would help him. Make some other stuff. We love our Zach. I'm going to turn off my camera during your presentation, Fred, so I can. You okay if I turn mine off? Yeah, don't take it personal, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, we are back at 12.31. I've got one. I think I've got Nance. Thank you. I've got three of us. Mr. Perez. Mr. Kristen. It's like recess, calling them in. No, you got to send them back to kindergarten. <laughs> All I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten. I love yep. that one. Only some people didn't learn it. <laughs> but we still are working on parts of it. I just need to get one more person and we can start. It's raining really hard. We need it. It was over here as well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. When I was teaching, this was always the big puzzle piece day. It, rainy days, you got out your puzzles and they got to go everywhere. It was a fun, it was a have, fun uh, one day. Yeah, have we heard any more from Sean? I have not. I've not heard from Mr. Yang. Oh, that wasn't uh, previously arranged. He, he, I know he said that he, was, he might have trouble with work. Originally said it would say it was going to work, um, and then he didn't understand it was during the day. So he was. I told him if you could make the whole day. Obviously, that's the that's what we signed up for. Uh, but if nothing else, we could do the afternoon since we had the um, these items up. So that that's the last I I heard from him. No, not starting out in a positive vein. We, we have recorded Mr. Porchina. Yeah, we have four. We Are do. we there? We can go. <clears throat> there he is. And we have our fifth. Yahoo! Okay. Um, Look who's coming in. And Mr. Yang's here. Excellent. Half an hour. <laughs> um, I am in my half hour. I had to run and buy food, so I am going to shut off my camera for part of the presentation. Um, no disrespect. I just, uh, you don't want to watch me eat a taco. So <laughs> we will start with uh, I will do the same. <laughs> 2021, 2022 open enrollment. Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment related to this item? You're on mute, Ms. Pinkerton. I did click it though. Um, Madam President, Board Albion, there is no public comments related to this item. Okay, excellent. And I'm going to make a, make a quick announcement, Ms. Albiani. Of course. Um, Ms. Pickerton is going to um, take off to go to a virtual meeting to learn about some new reporting requirements that we have with the state of California that are due on Monday. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll answer the questions about public comment moving forward, but we don't have public comment um, on any of the upcoming items. But uh, if you want to ask the question at the time, I'll answer. Yes, I will ask the question. Okay. For record, have a fun meeting. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Murray and Mr. Pierce for the presentation. 
Thank you, Board President Albiani, members of the board, Mr. Hoffman, Ms. Avalos. Um, I am going to share my screen at this point and make sure that um, all can see. Are we able to see that? Perfect. All right, great. So um, I am with uh, Mr. Robert Pierce for us to present the 2021-2022 intra-district open enrollment presentation. This presentation is structured in our why, how, and what format. Um, the why is the legal foundation of, of the process, the how we will, we will discuss the methodology and planning considerations that go through the process. And with the what we will ask for, um, we will determine school recommendations, timeline, and requested board actions. The why for interdistrict open enrollment um, under board policy 51 16.1, the Board of Education annually identifies schools available for open enrollment interdistrict transfers and Assembly Bill 1114 allows the board to limit open enrollment to schools that have space available based on future student enrollment projections. How that happens, um, Mr. Pierce and his um, outstanding team um, in coordination with secondary education uh, determine capacity of our schools um, enrollment projection determinations based upon um, work with developers and, and um, as students progress through our schools, so grade level um, enrollments um, to determine projections for the following year. And, uh, and then we have planning and decision making considerations, which include how enrollments impact of the quality of educational programming in our schools, each school's projected enrollment, the capacity for increased enrollment for multiple years, um, to maintain the viable and stable enrollments of each of our schools. And we also wanna make sure that we establish that no more than 5% of any school students be allowed to transfer to another school through open enrollment to maintain, cons maintain consistency of enrollment across our sites. Thank you, Mr. Murray. And I believe that the board is familiar with this chart and the purpose <laughs> of this chart and the next chart is just to show to you how much projected capacity, if any, is at every school for the 2021-22 school year uh, for the purposes of open enrollment. I do wanna share with the board that the numbers may look slightly different than the um, slides that Mr. Murray will be sharing with you shortly. And that's because um, we take the projected staffing enrollment, uh, we add into it um, our special education enrollment into the numbers that you're looking at now. And then we back out the estimated new open enrollees just to ensure that we have capacity at those sites. So the slide that you're looking at now pertains um, to our middle schools and we don't need to go through each and every one of them, but the point being here, um, with the exception of Albiani and Toby Johnson Middle School, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about Toby in a later slide, but with the exception of those two schools, uh, the remaining seven middle schools have ample capacity to accept open enrollment. You can go to the next slide. Uh, same information here for high schools, um, same information and same data goes into uh, the projected enrollment. Um, and similar to the previous slide for middle schools, um, we can cut to the chase here. And that is the feeder high schools in those same two regions. So you can see ample capacity at seven of our um, high schools here. Uh, but I should say six with limited capacity at Monterey Trail and then no capacity available for the Franklin region or the Pleasant Grove region. So what we are gonna request the board to take action upon is to approve a list of schools available to accept open enrollment transfers, <clears throat> to approve open enrollment cap at Consumers Oaks, Monterey Trail and Sheldon High Schools and approve our open enrollment timeline. And specifics on these will, be, will follow in the next few slides. With Kath and Albiani Middle School, we, our recommendation is that we close it. Um, this is a school that's, that you can see is well above capacity. And, um, um, and this includes how it feeds into Pleasant Grove High School um, and, and how that school is over capacity. So our recommendation for this, based upon the capacity and open enrollment is that we close continue to close Catherine Albiami Middle School. Pleasant Grove High School, 
Um, same thing, and I should say for the record that um, these are both schools that we have been redirecting out of due to new development in the area for several years. And so we are continuing to recommend they close. Um, you can see that um, um, they, are, they are moving towards um, having 3,000 students at that school. So um, we need to ma maintain, we believe we need to maintain closure at these schools in order to keep that school from um, far exceeding capacity. For Toby Johnson Middle School, um, you'll see that on this slide, their, their, their projected enrollment is um, 1,300 students. They have a capacity of 1,424, but we recommend that they stay closed because of the funnel that goes into Franklin High School. Franklin High School is far above capacity right now. So by limiting the amount of students that can come into Franklin High School from Toby and maintaining content, uh, continuity of enrollment for the students who are in Toby, uh, we recommend that it stays closed. Mr. Murray, if I may, just for the board's edification on Toby, there's a couple other points to make here as well that um, this assumes that the number of students that are currently have been historically transferring out of Toby Johnson um, remains. We never know that to be the case from year to year. So for the sake of conversation, assume 100 students from Toby Johnson either open enroll out of Toby to another middle school um, or they're uh, there's an administrative or an intra district transfer. Uh, we can't always assume that's going to happen. So we need to keep capacity there as well um, for the students who remain in that attendance area. So if that didn't happen, this number would jump up to about 1400 students. Um, I do want to mention that the residing students in that that boundary um, declined from 1476 in 2019 um, down to these numbers that you're seeing now. Uh, don't need to get too far into the weeds here, but what's been happening in our district, we call it the TK bubble. So the first three years of implementation of transitional kindergarten, we lost enrollment um, at the kindergarten level, again, for three years in a row. Uh, the current school year, the, that bubble is in six, seven, eight. Next year, it'll be seven, eight, nine, but that's having an effect on this as well. So that's why you see the low numbers here. Thank you. And again, we see Franklin High School um, um, with projected enrollment next year of 2,860 with a capacity of 2,538. So our recommendation on Franklin High School, again, is to, to maintain its closure. For Students Oaks High School, um, uh, we are recommending a cap at net 100 students. We believe there's still room to absorb students at Kasuma Oaks High School through the open enrollment process, but we also know that there's significant building there going on in that area. So, in a in a in a in a effort to balance the enrollment and allow student access into that school, but also making sure that we do not um, uh, overestimate what that process would be, we want the cap at 100 students. Last year. Um, we had 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 the cap at 200 students, but um, as the as the building continues and as the school continues to grow, we're asking that be reduced to um, 100 students this year. Monterey Trail High School uh, last year again was a net 50, and this year again is at 50 students. Um, you know we've been really fortunate; they've been right at that at their capacity, and um, it's a robust school, and we believe we can continue. Um, um, keeping them right at capacity with the, uh, with the ability to have an opportunity for um, net 50 students to open enroll. Craig, can we go back to CO real quick? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not trying to <laughs> upset anybody, but um, the pace of construction is really impressive in this area. Um, just, you know, every few days I go by and it just, it's visibly different. Um, for those of you who don't know, throughout the entire pandemic, they've not stopped. They've actually, there are entire new developments that have gone up. Um, can we even do this 100? Well, I think that um, um, for one thing, we revisit this every year. So yeah. if all of a sudden we saw a big influx of kids, we know we could, we could put it, close it next year if we needed to. So, um, and then in addition to that, um, Rob and his staff do a lot of work with the developers to anticipate how many are there. That's why we reduced it from 200 to 100. 
So we still believe this is doable at this time. And Ms. Ms. Chidas Espinosa, if I may. So yeah, we have, um, through the life of this uh, enrollment that you're seeing here, uh, we, we have 2,500 additional homes built in over the time periods that you see here. So 2,500 new homes, exactly to your point, anticipated over the next four years. The reason you don't see that 2,300 number jump higher than that is because, again, this slide only shows the 100 cap for the 2020, the 21, 22 school year, excuse me. Um, it also has students matriculating out because this slide assumes that we stop open enrollment after next school year. So if we continue that, you'll, you would see that number grow. And to Mr. Murray's point, we've been nimble with that. So uh, we have fluctuated since 2017 from 200 students to 100 students for two years, back to 200 students that, um, this current year. Um, we're suggesting 100 students next year. So we'll have to pay close attention to that on an annual basis based on your, uh, based on your point. If, if development continues at the pace that it's currently happening, uh, we could very well see the 2,500 home um, number grow over time it, because yeah. it's happening, as you said, at an exponential pace currently. Yeah, thank you both. So again, our recommendation for Monterey Trail would be to cap at net 50. And then um, new this year is we are recommending a cap at Sheldon High School. And um, Sheldon has been um, not capped for um, several years, uh, but with um, new infill development within their attendance area, plus the ongoing um, redirects from Pleasant Grove, um, we're very concerned that, that um, um, we need to keep an eye on Sheldon and their enrollment. Um, um, while they have capacity for 3,142 students, uh, we all we also know an ideal size of a school would not be 3,142 students, and, and I'll say in my opinion. So we'd like to keep an eye on this um, as we do our other schools, and allow them to have that that cap at 100 students for the. Uh, our recommendation is for the next year to have the cap at 100 students to keep monitoring that situation, both with the development within Sheldon's boundaries and with the redirects that are coming from Pleasant Grove, increasing their numbers. So to summarize uh, for school recommendations, it is recommended the following enrollment impacted schools be exempted or capped from the open enrollment process for 21-22 school year. Catherine Albiani Middle School closed, Pleasant Grove High School closed, Toby Johnson Middle School closed, Franklin High School closed, Kasuma Oaks High School capped at net 100, Monterey Trail High School capped at net 50, and Sheldon High School capped at net 100. Um, for the record, the residing population anticipated future growth at each school exceeds or is projected to exceed enrollment capacity. Schools and enrollments are currently being monitored to assess the need for continued redirection of students moving into the school's boundaries. This is our timeline. Um, so today we're doing our presentation um, for information and direction to you. And then um, should this move forward, um, we have information about um, our open enrollment timeline being advertised in a variety of ways. Um, we will open the open enrollment application Wednesday, January 27th. Um, on the 28th, we have an informational meeting uh, that we normally um, hold at different high school sites. This year we will be doing it um, online. We will close the process on February 5th, and then we take, um, uh, we will bring back information to a following board meeting on open enrollment for schools, including board communication. Um, and then we go through the process of random selection, um, listing students who got into the schools, providing them information, uh, working with homeschools and um, getting this out to people so we can close by April 5th. So at this time, we're requesting the board to approve the list of schools available to accept open enrollment transfers, approve open enrollment caps, and approve the open enrollment timeline. And we are available for any questions. If you have. Hey, Madam sorry. Chair, I'm ready to make a motion. We have a second. I second. Second. I have, like, I have a point of information. I have. I like discussion on 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 a number of things. Yes, 
<laughs> we have a first and a second. Okay. And now we will have, we can have discussion at this point. I, I'm sorry. We, we've rarely had this many issues. We, we, we have not had an opportunity to ask any questions at all. Yes. Um, I agree. I'm going to go down the list. We, we have a motion on the table and now we will have discussion and then we will have a vote. And I would like to call on people and we will start top down this time. Um, top being the top of my list, I have a list of your names. So, um, what information? Yes. Um, I, I'm looking at this uh, January 22nd, 2021 uh, agenda. I don't see no action items on this agenda for this issue. It's because we haven't approved them yet. Yeah, That's what they're asking us to do. Something that's an action item, yay or nay. Is that the standard procedure? It's listed, it's listed on the board agenda item, what the board's being asked to do. Oh, well, like I said, it's not on the printout of the agenda, January 22nd. It is on the board agenda item. If you open up the board agenda item, you will see the action asked. Open up the item, not not the not the open the open the item. Now, does that go to the public? So, yes. 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 the public, the public also yes. has available to our agenda online. No, I, I truly believe if you have these issues, Mr. Press, it would be helpful to be able to explain these to you prior to our meeting. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just sorry, man. It's not a. <laughs> I, I know it's it might appear differently, but let's let's do these things ahead of time if we can, please. We're gonna go on with our discussion. Um, we start, um, like I said, we'll go, go in the opposite direction. Ms. Um, Dr. Crystal martinez -Alier. My My questions um, are similar last time. I know we had surveyed the families regarding um, requests when they do um, want to request for open enrollment, the reasoning. Um, I was just curious, have those reasons changed much or is it the same? Um, we're seeing it because of like career academic communities or location wise. I mean, now we're all virtual. So I'm just wondering um, what was some of the feedback? So normally in this process, we, we provide a second um, um, board communication. So we do the first one with, with this process. And then as the families go through, we provide that second one. Um, um, we gave one last year in February where we summarized that. So that will be coming in the next when As we survey the families as they go through this process, we will be providing you with that information in a board uh, communication before the next meeting when we take a, the next action on this. And then I know in the past, it's always been a concern too when we're looking at open enrollment at certain school sites and then the amount of students that are leaving certain regions. Um, will you also be tracking that data like so we can see exactly like what regions maybe most of our families are choosing to move on to another school? Yes, that is part of that same communication, and we show you like three-year trends uh, within that table. Thank Those you. are my questions. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Chair Espinoza? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Forcina? Thank you. A lot of questions. Uh, first of all, let's go back, and I've asked this before. Assembly Bill... 1114 allows the board to limit the open enrollment, correct? Correct. Based but on certain conditions. Under certain conditions. So we can allow it, but we but are we also in a place where we don't have to allow it? If space is available, we have to allow it. That's all we have to do the analysis. But space available. has to be only one element of that decision. We, we've, we have seen before what it looks like at Sheldon High School with over 3,000 kids. Uh, and, and, and that presents uh, a number of problems. Our numbers that we have are all also inconsistent with the ideal numbers that Rob shared with us, I believe, both last year and the previous year for our middle and high school schools. 
Agreed. I mean, we're we're not we're not at a place where we're we're hitting our our ideal target numbers, but our sites are built in a way um, that they have the capacity. And where they where the capacity is there, um, we we do have to make those spaces available. The uh, we are keenly aware of the concerns that uh, that Sheldon, and we have no interest um, in getting back. Uh, you know, Laguna was near three thousand at one point before Franklin opened. Um, Sheldon was there um, and we have we don't have an interest in that so ideally you know we'll, we'll be bringing that uh, additional school in the, the rancher cordoba area in the not too distant future which will alleviate a lot of the stress but it's just where we are currently yeah but that'll be four or five years down the road um what, what data do we use to judge, uh, as stated on four, we look at it, how enrollments impact on the quality, of the educational programming. What, what, what do we utilize to make a determination in that area? Some of the factors are, so um, the availability of science labs and, and, and how um, when we get to capacity of schools, for example, um, how, how if you use classes over and over again, how can, for example, a science teacher have to prep that classroom over and over again versus having that time to prep in between classes? That would be one example of a data piece. Okay, let's uh, go to page five, please. Albiani's projected to, to to go to 1,500 kids, uh, 100 over, quote, their capacity. So what are we doing to help the staff, the kids, the families with what will be overcrowding? I mean, right now over at Albiani, they're teaching in the pod, which is teacher workspace area. Uh, have we thought about bringing portables in uh, any longer. We talked about portables in the past, uh, or I, I at least brought it up. Uh, can portables be placed at Albiani to alleviate their crowding issues? One of the ways we are helping alleviate the, the um, amount of students at Albiani is part of the redirect process is in establishing a date for how many students can come in off the redirect. So we've, we, we take careful consideration of that date, knowing that not only will it affect Albiani and their numbers, but also how that feeds into Pleasant Grove in the future. So, um, um, so we're, we, we're trying not to get to that 1500 number. Um, we're trying to keep it uh, at 1400 or less. Rob, do you wanna to speak to portables? Sure, that, that is always an option. Um, I, I think, you know, to Mr. Murray's point, um, you know, I, I believe the long-term goal for that region is going to be um, the 10th middle school, high school, um, and or, well, that would certainly include boundary changes, but boundary changes in that interim are also a possibility. But portables are always a, an option. It's just a matter of, do we, do we desire to bring that school to that capacity? Um, making it larger than what we've defined as the optimal capacity in our master plan. And, and that is a discussion we've never had as a board. And I think it's an important discussion. Uh, I, and I'm glad you brought up one subject because I have brought it up in the past and it didn't uh, receive a favorable welcome. And that is, are we at a point in time looking at the numbers of all the schools that we have to address the boundary issue. Is I think it's past time, uh, but I but that never comes to the table. Do we do we need to look at at boundary changes? And it's not only for our middle and high schools, also for some of the elementary schools. We are certainly um, open to uh, board direction to move forward. A discussion on uh, on boundary changes. It's you know one of those things 
um, that are that are often painful and difficult to do, uh, but we certainly can. One thing I will say, uh, I think there's an opportunity here um, in our current environment. Uh, you know, we're we'll see in the next presentation. We're going to do everything we can to get kids back in school um, for the uh, for the spring at some point this year, and obviously we'll be in some form of uh, in school um, next year. But I do think we're gonna have a significant number of our families uh, regardless that are gonna choose to do um, some form of distance learning moving in the future. So I think there's gonna be an opportunity where they may have a significant impact on the physical number of kids in our school. So I think rolling into the fall of next year and trying to get a snapshot of what the new reality might be um, another, you know, silver lining and all these things like the principal spoke to, we may get some relief with regards to student capacities um, at some of our sites based on um, what families identify as their preferred um, mode of instruction moving forward. You spoke to the, um, you know, the virtual academy, um, you know, there, we have more families there than we've had in the past and those families may stay, which, you know, could have an impact. So I think, I think next fall, taking a snapshot of where we are, because we really don't know how many families are going to um, you know, come back, uh, but I think the fall would be a really good time. What does it really look like? And uh, the boundaries, if, if, we're, if these numbers continue, at some point boundaries or another school or both um, is certainly uh, gonna be part of the conversation. Mr. Forchina? Yeah. I also believe we are going to have to look at our census data and we have committed to making some changes on board areas and that work seems to to parallel themselves well when we're looking very carefully of where students are in appropriate in relation to the school so i agree with you that 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 conversation um it, it lines up for something in the future thank you um and then when we go to the high schools, and it's really the same issue, you got Pleasant Grove with with basically 500 kids over their quote capacity. You got Franklin with 360 kids uh, over their quote capacity. And then you got schools like Elk Grove that are almost down a thousand. That's why I think boundaries uh, even though we may have uh, changes in 21-22 with respect to parent choice uh, because of COVID, uh, when I look at a lot of the numbers, the same thing like with Kerr, uh, they're down almost 800 kids. Uh, to me, talk, having, a, having a, a committee to take a cursory look at boundaries to me is not premature. Um, Mr. Fortini, you, you, oh, there you go. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say you accidentally muted yourself, but you fixed it. <laughs> um, um, and then I wanna go to Monterey Trail. With the projections, they're only gonna be uh, over, or excuse me, they're only gonna be uh, under five kids. Why don't we just close it? I mean, I, I support a closure for Monterey Trail uh, on the basis that they're basically at capacity. Um, they are they are at capacity based on allowing the inflow and outflow of uh, kids. If we didn't have the inflow in, then they would be they would be under, which means there's space available. So that's. That's the, that's the challenge of why we why we have reduced them over the years and now it's down to it's down to 50 uh, but I, I would think likely if this stays um, but they're at their max because they have kids transfer in they're not in their max because of the kids in their attendance area but again yeah, we've reduced it um, and it could come off the table next year but technically there is room there this year And, and then my, my uh, 
last questions goes to Sheldon. And it's simply this, how many more kids are gonna allow and not impact the quality of the education there? They are the third largest high school in the district with respect to enrollment numbers. How far do we go? That's why we should. What do we use to make the determination? I think we need to, to first, that's why we put the cap on this year because we see that growing. And then we're gonna to continue to look at the impact on the side as these numbers grow. Um, because we do, you know, between the redirects and the new building, we need to keep good good eye on that to see what that number would be. And, and the redirects speak to that issue of boundary. I mean, it's like, it's like why, do, why do kids come from uh, Sierra Enterprise past Medburg and go to Albiani, which is crowded, and Medburg's not? It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you're referencing right. those, are, those are the current those are the current boundaries um, again and we, we can certainly um, we got we, we have a lot of work to do within boundaries if that's if that's the direction we want to go okay well then I'm going to bring it up uh, later on in the agenda maybe uh, maybe at the next regular meeting because there's not a other items on the floor tonight but we hear you oh and then I'll sure. write it down and, and make it at our next meeting Thank you. Make it a motion. I second it. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, uh, we we can't we can't do anything about it today, Tony. Okay. It's a, well, it's a discussion item. It's it's on the agenda. We can Boundaries make a, or not. What? Boundaries, Boundaries are a whole other not. subject. Today we're talking about enrollment. Do you have any questions on the presentation? Boundaries Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm 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 talking right now. Boundaries affect enrollment all right are you finished mr forcina yeah i'm finished thank you if you could mute mr perez boundaries affect enrollment i don't see why we we cannot talk about enrollment he was talking about enrollment for about a minute or two and 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 boundaries and you didn't disqualify him on that issue when i talk about it you disqualify me no, and when I, I want to make a motion about it, you disqualify me. It's not the subject matter. No, What's... I told Mr. Forchina he was informed a motion would not be appropriate today on that item. And I was saying the same thing to you. Not... Are you saying it's not the subject matter we're talking about? School boundaries are not the agenda item. There's a lot of things that influence uh, open enrollment, but we can have a conversation about boundaries specifically, but it'll need to be brought up at a future meeting. And Ms. Albiani and I have heard this conversation. Um, and so we, we understand it's a, it's a topic of interest. Well, I think it's a topic of interest when the quality of education affects our students. So therefore we should have it at the next meeting. Everything's important. We, have, we already have the next agenda is pretty well chock full. Um, and you'll see there's another item that's coming up that's gonna even make that meeting even more chock full. So there's a thousand really important topics, but right now we're talking about open enrollment. Okay, and, and going back to my point of information regarding the agenda item, uh, I look, if you look at the agenda webpage, there is no I, I sent you if you look item, in the chat there is no action item if you look in the chat open your ramp open enrollment if you look in the chat and you open the item you will chat. see board action what? the board of education is asked to review and approve the recommendations for the 2122 open enrollment I'm that's talking the, about that's, the agenda item that is on the agenda item if you would open the agenda item I am I'm on number five, 20, 21, 20, 22. Open the open. item. There's Double no click on it. Double there. click on it. I did. And you, if you double click on it, you will see it says, this is the quote. The Board of Education is asked to review and approve the recommendations for the 21-22 open enrollment. Review and approve, that's action. Well, okay, let me... Prior to this one, 
usually we have the format it says action item correct this is I a think, special meeting agenda yeah. which is different than our regular meeting agenda this is a board meeting this is a this board workshop. I think what the confusion is, this is a board workshop. It's not our standard regular board meeting where we have the action items labeled separately. Correct. It's a special meeting. The, the rules and the laws are different. Can we move forward with this item? How are they different? Um, you, I think that's the education we can get to you later. Someone would be happy to give you an education on that a little later. <laughs> Do you have any questions pertaining to the presentation that was made? Okay, my teacher brain counted to 20, Mr. Perez. Should I move on to Mr. Yang? Oh, are you speaking to me? <laughs> yes, I've spoken to you. About, well, no, no, no. Um, there, a special board meeting because it was it was changed from one date to another. Other than that, that's the only what's that, that's. This is a this is one of the special. Why we're having is, our meeting today. This is one of the special board meetings. This is one of the special board meetings that the board requested so that we could do and bring back the regional meetings. This is a regular meeting, but it's a special version of a meeting. And the special meeting allows us to just, this, <laughs> this is a, it's a regular, we, we, it's on the calendar. Regular we scheduled meeting, this, right? we scheduled this meeting months ago. It's on the regular agenda, right. but it's regular special, meeting. meaning that we're only focusing on a select number of topics and it's not a general meeting where we cover a wider variety of topics. And the public comment on a special meeting is limited to comments on the special meeting agenda. There's not just a general public comment section. So it's a, uh, there's different forms of meetings and this is the workshop slash special board meeting format that the board asked for several years ago that we've now built in regularly that build that now we get to do the regional meetings like that and other topics that require some longer conversations and sometimes we can have although at our regular meetings we still have some pretty long conversations but as a general yeah, rule, chair can i request that we continue the, the brown act conversation offline please yes that would be excellent thank you all uh, right point of point of information then if if you're going to say on on the notices notice it says information for virtual special board meeting then then i, I suggest that you include special workshop board meeting thank you thank you all right mr yang did you have any question thank you can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Quick question. I see that <clears throat> these numbers, uh, in particular the screen that we're looking at here. So like President Grove, uh, we have um, exceeded the capacity. Um, so we are redirect them to other schools, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> Mr. Fushina mentioned earlier about the mobile. Now, are, are, is that something that we have done or going to do for present growth? I'm just trying to understand. Are, are you saying, are you talking portables? Yes, portable, yeah. Um, I don't think that they need them at this time. Okay. And is that something we would normally do when they exceed the capacity? I think that would, be, that would be well redirect and then also um, maximize um, every inch of the, of the campus as well. Mr. Yang, we have both the Pleasant Grove High School and Elementary. So, do you want to specify which school you're asking about? Uh, the high school. Okay. Now, I just try to understand the process a little bit better, uh, being a new uh, board. So that yes. I understand. Uh, we use a variety of tools, um, you know, adding actual physical space 
is something uh, that we can do, but there's a significant cost that goes along with that. So part of the, that's the balance of um, adding additional costs with regards to additional um, physical portables on the campus, plus just the additional kids that would be there. Um, so redirection is something that we use um, oftentimes in our larger areas that are growing. And usually the next high school comes along um, and that's that's another way you know down the road that that uh, uh, that capacity gets uh, relieved down the road. Okay, so my assumption. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Pierce is an excellent resource, and and I'm sure he'd be happy to meet with you. This is um, okay. there are many balances and checks um, on those decisions and laws okay. that affect how how these numbers are created that are good to understand as well. Okay, yeah, I, I will follow up on that. So, okay, no, thank no, you. No. You, you have the right to ask those questions right here in this board meeting. You don't have to go over there and meet with him later on. If you are interested or want to point out some information, you have the right to ask that question right here at this board meeting. And I don't see why you should cut him off, Mr. Chairman. No one's cutting him off, but he, if he yes, wants, a deep, uh, if he wants a deep understanding, if he wants a deeper understanding of the process where staff is happy to sit down and walk through, uh, just like just like we have with other members of the board well, over the years. Well, how do you know he doesn't have another board meet, uh, other issues that, or uh, questions? You just cut him off. No, I was just about to ask him if he had any other questions. You've cut me off. Can I please lead the meeting, Mr. Perez? You've had your turn. I'm just, I'm just defending my fellow board member that you, you do, you're starting to do the same thing you, to him, to Mr. Yang that you do to me constantly. So, if you have any questions, Mr. Yang, do you have any other questions? Oh, I do have, uh, yeah, another question. Okay. okay. I was just going to ask, um, do we have like um, metric that, uh, or, or you know, statistic that shows? Um, show the number of students um, that lives within the district, let's just say Valley High, but um, I don't know, they, they go to a different school for any reason. So, I mean, is there any data that shows that? Because I'm looking at Valley yeah. High, which is in my district, and uh, the capacity is, um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's not met. And uh, I know the other schools are kind of the same, but present growth is uh, the opposite, which is exceeded the attendance capacity. I'm just trying to understand our metric. If there's We have a second presentation that we'll do for you, I'm saying for the entire board. Uh, after this process is over, what we actually show is uh, the number of kids that are in, in the area that are going to the school and the number of kids that ask to go to other schools. And so that, that's part of the second. There's, there's two okay. parts to the open enrollment presentation. And that will be part of the second part of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Chris. That's Mr. all Yang, I have. We, thank you. We do yeah. track that. We have a really sophisticated um, system that that overlays all of our boundaries and all of our students, where they actually live, what schools they reside. It's broken down by grade level, demographic. Um, so it's the difference of what we call residing enrollment and physical enrollment. Um, but we do share that information with the board as well. Okay. Right, and um, we will see that later on, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, Nancy made a motion, it was seconded. Discussion, I have a roll call vote. Mr. Yang? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Perez? You're muted, sir, I can't hear you. You're still muted, sir. I'd like to make an amendment to this issue to have a meeting within a month to discuss this uh, item. Is there a second from Mr. Forcino since he's... We're in the middle of a vote. I don't know if you can yes, make, can a, make substitute a substitute motion right now. Can I make an amendment to this? Uh, I don't accept the amendment. Oh, I'm, I'm asking if somebody on this board would have second that. We I made the motion, so I don't accept the amendment. There's there a you go. Second. You can only amend it if it doesn't pass. It's already so If it doesn't pass, we will come back to you, Mr. Perez. What is your vote, sir? 
Yes. Thank you, Mr. Forchina. Uh, is is uh, part of my vote, you're gonna get a comment. I don't understand how it's in anybody's best interest to hold classes in a teacher workspace. Uh, but I, I will vote yes. Noted. Ms. Martina Salir. Aye. And I myself. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Murray and Mr. Pierce. Our next presentation. Excuse me, I'd like to make the motion that we have, we ha have a meeting regarding this issue, regarding uh, boundaries within the, within a month. Mr. A Perez, we, no, we talked about the fact that we can, are limited to the things that are on this workshop agenda. I don't know if you recall when I opened the meeting, I talked about it being a special board meeting and only comments directly related. Um, while those things are, I mean, our whole school is interrelated. I could, I could tie um, a PE rule to anything we're talking about, but this is not directly related on this. I think Mr. Fortuna has expressed his concern with this and his intention to bring it up in a future meeting, which we welcome. And so we do not have the space for that motion to entertain it today, mm -hmm. but I believe Mr. Fortuna has committed to bringing it up in the future. Yeah, Tony, okay, uh, again. Yeah, we, gotta, we have to bring it up at the next meeting, Tony. All right, thank you. Madam Chair, I'm not sure that, that I was called for that roll call vote. So just let the record show that I'm an I, and I also want to associate myself with uh, Mr. Fortuna's interest in opening that boundary discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we'll move on to the 2020-2021 governor's proposed budget update. We are running behind a little bit. Um, Ms. Pinkerton, is there, oh, Mr. Hoffman, is there any public comment related to this item? There are not. There are no public comments. Ms. Hayes. Shannon, I'll share President it. President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Um, we, my, uh, esteemed colleague, Mr. Pierce and I are going to discuss with you the um, governor's budget proposal that he announced on January 8th. Um, this information is really, really new and fresh off the mouths of peoples. And so everything is running through the legislature right now. So um, I do have good news though, to bring you for a change. So this was really, really good. Um, and I'm gonna let, Rob's gonna drive this and then um, we'll pause in between because we actually have two separate presentations kind of melded together here to allow um, board to ask questions before we move on to the second half of it. Shannon, if I may, I just wanna make sure everybody can see the presentation. Yes. Okay. And what we'll do for the governing board, we, we don't want, we, we're gonna bifurcate this presentation. So it all pertains to the governor's budget proposal. Um, we're gonna conclude the, the more fiscal um, piece of the budget um, and then see if you have any questions pertaining to that because I don't want those fiscal issues and questions to get lost in the other portion of his proposal which is the reopening proposal and then I'm going to share that information with you and then you can ask any questions of us pertaining to that so um, sorry to cut you off Shannon I just wanted to be clear with the board on that piece understood Thank you. So um, as I mentioned, I have good news for us for a change. Um, back last June, we thought that we were going to have to hold our breath and cross our fingers and toes and hope that the state budget um, turned around and it looks like it has. And currently um, employment is actually um, has 4.1 million more jobs in December than last April. Housing permits have increased by 8.5%. Stock, stock market, boy, I can't speak today. Stock market set all new all time highs and consumer spending still remains positive. So from that perspective, um, the more people that spend money, obviously it's putting more money into the economy. And so we are happy to see that. Next for the slide. board's edification, that's a statewide average for single family permits. Ours has increased by about 30% over the past year. So looking at the state's general fund budget, um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through this, but I did wanna point out, um, the governor is still making deposits into the rainy day fund. So you can see there, it's the acronym is PSSSA and it's got a little asterisk there. You can see how much money is now in there. And again, these are statewide numbers. So we went from seven, 
147 million to $2 billion. So um, a large amount is sitting in there. The budget looks really good, at least from the state's perspective for uh, fiscal year 21-22. Um, there are some caveats that come when um, certain um, measures are met as far as um, the district then having to cap their reserves. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So in the governor's budget, the first three bars there, you can see for 1920, 2021, and 2122, in his budget summary, he's showing that there are actually surpluses for those three years. So 21, 22 is the one that we're most interested in right now. And they, have, they are currently projecting a $15 million surplus. However, in the out years, 22, 23 forward, they are projecting deficits. And when that happens, and we have multi-year colas in place um, for us, we have to be careful with that. So um, it'll be interesting to see how 21-22 plays out and what that impact is going forward. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, it starts with fiscal year 1920. And with Proposition 98, there is a minimum guarantee that the state must match um, so there's enough money in the budget to where the state's budget where they went back and settled up 1920. 2021, we did not get a COLA. We are still not getting a COLA, but there was an $11.9 billion increase than what was originally anticipated. And then in 2122, they're increasing another 3 billion above the revised 2021 level. What that means is Proposition 98 supplies 40% um, to schools, um, K-14, and they're going to actually shore everything up. And so that when they do that, there's additional monies that become ongoing for us. So what that looks like. So as I mentioned, we had a zero COLA in fiscal year 2021. The statutory COLA was supposed to be a funded COLA of 2.31%, but you can see there it's zero. We projected for 2021, 2122, and 2223 that we would have zero COLAs going forward. And that was based on the state's adopted budget in July. They have now revised their estimates for 2122, and the statutory COLA is 1.5%, but because we didn't get the 2.31, we will have a funded COLA in 21-22 school year of 3.84%. So no new money in the current year, but can you go back, Rob, one? No new money in the current year, but we're gonna get it all ongoing starting next year. So that's a good thing. Um, a couple of our categorical programs, not a couple, a lot of our categorical programs don't get the funded COLA. They get something different. So like our special education mandate block grant, um, food, nutrition, and some of those others, they won't get the 3.84%, they're going to get 1.5%. And that's typical. Um, the last two years, um, I think it's a little mid in the last two years, might have been just this last year, um, they've had a zero COLA. So this is good to see um, that they are actually applying it to our categorical programs because as categorical programs have personnel in them, just like the unrestricted general fund, if those programs don't receive COLA, it's more difficult for them to afford what they've purchased. So that was a good thing to see COLA proposal for them. So we talked about Proposition 98. We talked about um, the deposit into the rainy day fund, um, which means all four of these factors are now met, which means it triggers the uh, cap on district's reserves and how much we can have in reserve that's not um, committed. So starting in um, fiscal year 22-23, we will have to ensure that our discretionary reserves are not more than 10%. And that if for whatever reason, we're not right now, by the way, if for some reason we were to be above that 10%, then the board would have to take action on what to do with those reserves um, going forward. Then deferrals. Um, I was going to talk about cash um, for a little bit. I know that we send to you guys a BC um, on our cash flow monthly. And the deferrals are going to cause us to have negative cash in our uh, fund one, 
and Fund 12, which is our child development fund, and Fund 13. Fund 13 has a significant deficit right now as a first interim. This is one of the um, indicators that we used when we filed our first interim negative. So the governor is proposing to pay down a big chunk of the deferrals, but until they change what has been enacted for the deferral process, it's still in play for next school year. So part of the legislature's work is um, we think are going to push back with the um, budget proposal to pay down more of those deferrals. So budget is one item and you can have enough money coming in, but if the state doesn't pay us the cash, we can still have a problem without meeting our obligations. So we are watching both pieces at the same time, but this is huge. This is very, very good news because those deferrals are gonna start next month. Then we look at the LCFF. Um, the 3.84% is a compounded amount. So they adjust the 2021 first, get the new number, apply it to 21-22. Um, grades K-3 and 9-12 both have a grade span adjustment. So our formula for LCFF um, is the same as it's always been. They're just applying the COLA here. And then if we look at supplemental and concentration, you can see it starts with your base here, which we just saw on the other slide. Um, the supplemental grant, which is 20%, and then an additional 50% um, for our unduplicated pupils that are above 55%. Um, something the board needs to be aware of, the UPP or the unduplicated pupil percentage based on our EL free reduced lunch and um, foster youth students. It was very difficult this year to get parents to turn in forms to indicate um, their status, if you will. When that happens, even though we're on a three year rolling average, we were so close to that 55%. We were 56 point, I wanna say 82%. It wouldn't take a whole lot of um, parents not turning in forms to get us to drop below the 55%. So um, Michelle's office, along with our principals and um, communications office, we did this huge push to get forms back in. The state's allowing us through the month of February, I think it's towards the last part of February, to revise that information. And so we're working on that. Preliminary numbers, it was really ugly. We were down into the, um, I wanna say upper 40s. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that we had enough come in because it is a three year rolling average. Um, we'll feel it for a little bit. So um, I'm hoping that we're back just right at that 55%. So for LCFF, everything that we just talked about, our projection for 21-22 school year is $612 million. And that's an estimated ongoing new revenue of 22 million. So this was very, very good news for Oak Grove. And here's why. So for first interim, um, this is what you saw. Um, the state reports that we filed with our County Office of Ed um, shared that we were projecting, and it's our um, certification, our self-certification, that we would not be able to meet our financial obligations in this kind of scenario, meaning no new state revenue, um, possibly loss with supplemental concentration qualifying students, negative cash balances because of deferrals, and you can see how small our reserve was getting. So with that, um, not that we thought, you know, you know, tomorrow we're going to, have to close our doors because we can't function, but enough of a um, red flag to say, okay, like, let's stop for a minute, because to consume $33 million in that third year is difficult at best. I mean, we're talking about laying off folks. So this is where we were at the end of October. The state now has released what their budget proposal is. If we go to the next slide, here's our happy news. So this is more in line with what we normally see. So a 3.84% COLA is on the high side, but it's compounded again over the two years. 1.28% and 1.61% projected for the two out years. I think those are reasonable. Um, they are a little bit lower than what the Department of Finance put out. Um, these are directly from School Services of California. We think they're a little bit more in alignment. We have traditionally used School Services of California. We usually don't vary from them. So again, it's an estimate. The legislature has a lot of work to do between now and May revise. 
but this does put us positive. It puts us positive in that third year, 3.7 million. And as a rule of thumb, our normal year-to-year -year annual cost increases for step and column, um, retirement, um, healthcare, we need an, a, approximately $17 million in new ongoing revenue year over year. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's got to come straight from the state. It could be a combination of growth ADA that helps get you there. Um, but we're not seeing that growth right now either because of the pandemic. So projections of revenues is um, difficult. Projections of the rest of the costs of the district is, is pretty static, right? Salaries and benefits are what they are. So um, I was just tickled pink when I saw this. So if we can get rid of deferrals, I think that we will be in a pretty good shape. And you can see our reserve is estimated at 14.62%. I believe the statewide average is like 17%. So we're kind of ballpark in there. Um, I personally don't like to see it drop below 10 because that's kind of scary. Um, and I can tell you the mandated 2% reserve isn't enough to cover a payroll. So um, that's a minimum reserve is 2%. And I just think it's interesting that um, the state seems to think that that does something. So anyway, um, $100 million in our fund balance if nothing changes, meaning our ADA comes back whole, um, supplemental concentration goes back to where it's supposed to be. Um, these colas actually materialize. So a lot of different things need to happen to make this hold true. But I like it. I just I don't I don't want to go by this without reiterating to the board where we were at first interim. And you can't understate enough how important that ongoing cola is to our district. Um, going from first interim in a, in a negative status with those zero colas to pretty minor colas moving forward in the, the overwhelming difference it makes to our bottom line. So let's talk a little bit about special education. Um, there's several different groups out there trying to get traction on increasing um, the amount of money both from federal and state for special education. For those of you that follow the special education budget, um, no real increases over time really at all. We get approximately 35 million from the state and then another 10 million from the feds. Um, and I think our total budget right now is in the neighborhood of 90 million. So not a whole lot of um, categorical money, but this was huge. So the base funding for um, special education is called AB 602, which drives the actual formula itself. Um, the governor did propose to boost the, um, the base rate to $625 per ADA. It is now going to be subject to COLA this year. So this was huge that it stayed on top of it and that it was made ongoing. Um, there is still talk and still traction trying to be made to um, still get districts up to where they are. But um, seeing that this is here and that there's a COLA applied to it, that, that's good news for us as well. And then special education early intervention grant. This was um, an attempt to help funding with uh, preschoolers. So ed code requires that districts have to fund special education services to students between the ages of three and to five. But we don't receive any funding for three to five year olds for special education. So it's completely um, funded through the district. The state actually set aside and gave us money last year um, he's proposing again this year to put some money in there. Um, we estimate that we should see approximately 2.9 million of that. So that's excellent as well. It doesn't even put a drop in the bucket, but something's better than nothing. So like I said, this, this budget had lots of little good little nuggets this time. So happy to have that. And then community schools, mental health and school climate. So there are grants that, and it's funny because you know we went to LCFF, we weren't supposed to have grants, but we have grants. So community schools, not to be confused with community day schools, um, the district has applied for a grant this year. Um, he's proposing to put monies in um, for next school year. And essentially it is you are applying for monies to create a community school within your community that has high poverty. So it's, a school within a school for lack of a better description, but it's not a disciplinary um, function like you see with um, community day schools. 
And then mental health programs, the governor is very much been pushing this um, ever since last March about the mental health problems for um, students and families. And so um, they're proposing 450 million for that. Again, these are statewide numbers. And then school climate surveys, um, there's a proposal for $10 million for county offices of education to assist districts with conducting school climate surveys to access community needs under COVID-19. And then again, more grants. So monies that we had last year, monies that are proposed for next year in the area of professional learning and teacher effectiveness, and it's essentially to get um, more teachers in the pipeline um, to help target the teacher shortage. These monies are a little bit funny monies because in the past we've had to have um, matching component to go with these. So it'll be interesting to see what the details are um, as this rolls forward. And then um, for food nutrition. So we've been watching food nutrition's budget for well, since March. Um, we're happy to see that there's an additional 75 cents per meal being added. Um, we actually physically just got a check with that amount in there already. So that was nice to see. Um, because we don't have students buying meals and we're essentially just feeding our most needy and parents are able to pick up um, the whole process by which we are delivering meals is just different. And the number of meals being prepared is significantly less, although the labor that is attached is, is not. So that's why we're seeing such a um, hardship with them right now. So happy to have the extra 75 cents. Like I said, the, the first check's already received. So we were excited to see that as well. So we have good positive things happening. So it's good, good, good. And then the federal stimulus package. Um, the ESSER funds we have currently and the GEAR funds we have currently, the ESSER funds for us did not have that time sensitive end date to it um, and neither did the GEAR. The governor is proposing, um, not the governor, excuse me, president is sending over more monies in the same fashion that the ESSER funds are. So for us, it's based on Title I. Um, we are expecting to receive approximately $60 million. This money is, people will tell you that this money is open-ended and I'm gonna tell you it's not. And so it has been a challenge for us as a district to spend federal money because federal money comes with its own rules and regulations and they are not waivable. So um, happy to have the money again, right? It's just going to be interesting in how we can leverage and get the most out of it for us. On the gear side, um, he is proposing to give private schools directly funds. Um, previously in the ESSER funds that we were allocated, uh, we are obligated to make sure that we consult with our private schools and set aside money for the private schools. So we won't have that burden. The state's going to take that on, but the governor still has not um, come up with how he, he hasn't provided a detailed plan on how he's going to spend the next round of gear funding. And Shannon, I just want to share for the board's sake, um, Superintendent Hoppen and I have spoken. And, and one of the things, in addition to the federal money that's just recently been approved, um, you might have seen today that President Biden has now signed another $1.9 trillion um, package that should be working its way towards school districts as well. Where we would like to see this money go to, to Ms. Hayes's point is treated more like the era funds you might remember from the last recession. Um, those dollars truly had no strings attached. And it's not that we want to be able to be wasteful by any means, but what a lot of folks don't see behind the scenes is how Ms. Hayes has to account for these dollars. And when there's people, there's time accounting, and there's all these other things that come into play when and if we're audited. And um, it makes it very, very difficult to be flexible and to spend those dollars in a way that we would see benefit to our students. Um, so we're hoping for some relief, if not with this first or the second allocation, um, definitely the third. So we'll be, we'll be doing that work behind the scenes at the federal level. Well, I disagree with you. Uh, I'll be working behind the scenes also through my contacts to get the money in those Title I schools high poverty schools that need extra resources ex as a result of the achievement gap and learning loss. 
uh, and we need to be held accountable for those types of funding. It's very similar to what happened in LCFF in the early stage of, of the rollout. You know what? I disagree with spending money on salary increases, you know, direct services to students. Yeah, I'm, I'm not suggesting for salary increases, Mr. Perez, and, and frankly, um, money's being directed to Title I schools is a great thing. And it's not that that we're worried about. It's how we have to account for those expenditures. And it's the nitty gritty that has to happen on the accounting side um, that, that we lose flexibility, even in things that we want to do at our Title I schools. That's what I'm referring to. As I mentioned, um, when we took a peek at the multi-year projections, these are the different COLAs um, from Department of Finance and from School Services of California. And so, as I mentioned, School Services of California, they're the, the third row there, um, are much more in align with what we typically see as far as funded COLAs are concerned. And then looking at CalPERS and our different retirement systems, CalPERS is, um, has its own board that dictates the rates based on their actuarials. We do not see any um, change from what was originally projected. You can see there that the prior year DART board, they had 20.7, um, it's not been adjusted. And so um, it is what it is. They will go through their process. Um, CalPERS usually puts out their new rate for school districts sometime in um, around the month of May, I wanna say. So if there is a fluctuation, it's usually very, very small. Um, but we may see something change um, when we get further into the cycle. And then CalSTRS, um, this was always interesting. So I find it interesting. 8.25% uh, was the rate that was in statute forever and ever. And you can see how it's, you know, they had proposed for it to go up in these 1.85% increases. Um, it's now tapered off. So that increase all the way through, it says July 1 of uh, 2018. That was its cap. That was its end date, if you will. And so there's language that's written that says that it can increase, but it can't increase more than X percent. And I can't remember what it is, so I'm not going to try to quote it. Um, but you, they are now using their actuarial to drive their rates, just like PERS does. And you can see for 2021 and 21, 22, they're actually projecting a decrease. And again, these don't, these rates are employer contributions. They don't have anything to do with the employee side. Um, this is our burden, and we actually record the states, um, our portion of the state's liability on our books. Okay. So that concludes the fiscal component of the governor's budget proposal. And um, if you have any questions about that, now is probably the best time, President Albiani, so it doesn't get lost in the next portion of the presentation. Excellent, thank you. We can start with Mr. Perez. Perez. Okay, uh, it's my understanding uh, these funds are tied into our our plan. Remember, remember, uh, correct? I'm and having trouble that. hearing you, Mr. Perez. I'm sorry. Well, uh, it's nice to hear the budget, but we can't get this. We uh, we're not entitled to this money unless we do X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to wait until the next part of the presentation because. You know, in order to get this money, we have to do testing of our our students, testing of our, our staff, et cetera, et cetera, all these other uh, requirements. So, Mr. Perez, think, you're confusing you're confusing the general budget, which is what we just covered with you, with a small sliver of two billion dollars that the governor has set aside for the reopening plan. So, this this here has nothing to do with testing. It's just our, it's just the regular governor's budget proposal we will cover the the information with regards to the governor's reopening plan in the second half of this presentation but this one is not tied to testing or reopening of schools in any way well you mentioned on on, on the on the governor's budget in in order to open up schools earlier we have to do x y and z as a result of that if we it's for a separate peel off piece right. of money that he wants to do that's coming next it doesn't have anything to do with these dollars 
why, so why was that not presented in this budget and uh, presentation that if we uh, want extra more monies for our students, you know, 400 to five, what is, what's the amount? It's it's the very next slide, Mr. Perez. Okay. But we're gonna, okay. Mr. Perez, right. it's the very next slide, but we're taking a time out and asking if you have any questions on anything that's been presented to this point. And the very next slide is the topic that you want to talk about. And you'll have all the time to talk about that one too. So the next slide or the next presentation? The next slide. As soon as the board shares their thoughts about this first set of slides, the very next slide is the slide you're talking about. Mr. Price, should the governor's budget proposal come to fruition? This slide that I've pulled up, this is what it's going to do to our district, regardless of what we do. The right. program you're talking about is, again, just a proposal, and it's a voluntary thing for school districts. Um, right. This is what would happen fiscally to our district here. So the question that I have is that if we want to pursue extra, extra budget dollars, we're going to talk about that next. Okay. All right. But that's going to be included with this later, right? If we do, if we do pursue that. Two things have, yeah, well, two things have to happen. The right. legislature has to approve the proposal and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then right. yes, we have to participate as well. Okay, and there's requirements and blah, blah, blah. A lot of them. Okay, very good, looks pretty good. Uh, did you did not mention the LAO, uh, uh, Legislative Analyst Office uh, uh, report, anything like that? So this portion of the governor's budget Right. was met with open arms by many. Right. Um, right. They may still be playing with um, some of his, uh, what Shannon called grant programs mm -hmm. and some of the one-time nature of the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, but the LAO also, also spoke to the fiscal, um, the fiscal mindedness in having some of those one-time programs as a crumple zone if the right. economy doesn't rebound. Um, but overall the, the LAO had fairly positive comments with regard to this portion of the budget. Right, so, okay, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very happy. <laughs> I agree. Mr. Yang, did you have questions? No, thank you for the presentation so far. Number looks good. That's great. Oh, we see your family, how fun. Um, Mr. Forchina. No questions till we have final information. Okay, but we are understanding that this is the final, for the governors, this is the proposed budget for this. Right. So the okay. legislature will weigh in between now and ultimate adoption. He's gonna have a May revision based on what's happening in the economy at that point in time. And then to Mr. Forchina's point, until they approve something in late June. It's oh, just way to go. <laughs> but we like this talk. So far, so good. Thank you, Ms. Chair Espinoza. Um, no questions, just one comment from me. Um, first, I guess a compliment to you, Ms. Hayes, how you do this kind of work and remain as optimistic as you do. Uh, well, it says nothing but good things about your character. Um, Unfortunately, I, I feel the need to balance that a little bit just to make sure that the, the general public understands there we are seeing good news today and the headlines have been screaming, you know, what they ripped straight from the governor's press releases, which is record amounts of money going to education. And I want to provide some context to that, which is, um, gosh, where to begin? Uh, we never really know how much money we're gonna get next year. We never really know how much we're gonna end up getting in the current year. They will go back a few months later and revise the year that we're in, you know, the money we were supposed to have started spending six or eight months ago. So, you know, this is all looking good because they underestimated essentially how the economy was gonna perform and what the tax receipts were gonna be. And all, you know, so compared to that, yes, everything is, is great. Um, but I just want folks to understand why, you know, they're not seeing more enthusiasm, at least from me, because, you know, uh, one of uh, Ms. Hayes' first charts showed three years of surplus and then three years of deficit. 
that's pretty typical for us. So I just, I want folks to have that in the back of their head. And if they're asking themselves, gosh, you know, if they're so flush with money, you know, why aren't we spending on a bunch of new programs? That would be why, because it is the roller coaster of public education funding in California. That is all for me. I'll step. Also, I like to add that student per spending dollars, California ranks almost bottom to the last of ranking in the whole United States. Yes, it looks good, but yet, you know, student spending per, uh, California spending per student is very low, yeah. very low. Ms. Chinas Espinoza, it's, it's an excellent point, and I know you'll know where I'm stealing this quote from, um, but to your point, the notion that we're getting a lot more money in 21-22, um, it would be like you cut somebody's pay in 2021 and then paid them the same amount of money that they were previously getting in 21-22 and say, you got a raise. Yeah, yeah. As I, mean, I didn't get a raise, you just restored me to where I should have been and where I was you restored me to prior to my cut. So that's an excellent point you made. Yeah, and, and there are some similar phenomenons. I mean, you know, they, they keep us starving for a cola, which means we don't even know if we're gonna keep up with the cost of inflation so that when we do get it, you know, we celebrate that we're yay, keeping up with inflation or, or do other things like instead of giving money to all of the schools that they were already owed, they hold back 2 billion and, you know, make it a competitive or make it a grant program with strings attached. So there's a lot going on here that is, other than providing schools with the resources that we should have. So I will step off my soapbox. Thank you. Um, Dr. Martina Salir. Um, just echo the same comments as my colleagues. I just wanna commend the work um, Mrs. Hayes always brings back her level of expertise, um, every item and being available to answer any questions. So I appreciate what goes into this. I know it's not easy at time to forecast or project like you had mentioned, um, because of the budget and forecasting, sometimes things move unexpectedly, but thank you for the work. Okay, I only had one question and I think I have solved my question by reading it a third time, but on page 14, we are currently given $625 per ADA for special ed and they're putting the COLA of 1.5, which will bring us to $634.38. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, okay, I did, I actually have two questions. And then I think it would help, it help when, when we talk about state monies, there's a simple breakdown of kind of how we assume how much we're going to get. Can, can you, again, so if it's a 1 billion in the state, we kind of feel like we know that means we're getting how much, Ms. Hayes? It used to be 1%, it's now slightly less than that. We get okay. about 85 cents to every dollar. Okay, and that's just, that helps you figure out how things are going. So when they say they have 10 million for school climate surveys, we can think we would get- I would say roughly 1%. 1% 1 of that mm -hmm. to do this kind of school survey. Yep. Okay. Well, I think sometimes we get into these bigger numbers and, it, and it, you don't know okay. what it means to us. Yeah, that's a good point for the board's sake. If you hear that K-12, Prop 98's K-14, so that percentage gets a little lost there, but if you hear that K-12 is going to get X amount of money, we're 0.89% of that, right, Ms. Hayes, roughly? Yeah. Used to be 1% before LCFF, but that's, that's how the calculation works now. I, I just have always found that helpful when I'm watching news and seeing. Good point. All right. Now we're gonna to go to the second part of the presentation. Excuse me. I do have a question based on your question. Oh, yeah. yes, Mr. Fortina. Um, Mr. Perez, I'll call on you next. Okay. Uh, based on a presentation we, we had not too long ago with the proposed increase for special ed, if, my, if I remember correctly, uh, we would still be expending in excess of somewhere between 80 and 90 million dollars from the general fund to support special ed is that correct that's correct yeah so you know again when they tout their horn uh there needs to be a balance coming from somewhere that says hey uh 
you're, you're not telling the whole truth because uh, another 80 to 90 million dollars back into the general uh, ed population could fund a lot of program. Okay, Mr. Perez, did you have one more comment on that part of the presentation before we move on, sir? Yes, on special ed, um, I like our staff to prepare for to our board uh, board members uh, like a like a press release or a, you know, issue paper that we could share with the general public, with the legislators, both federal and state, our issue here within Elk Grove Unified School District on our on our on our budget items that Mr. Forsen just mentioned, so we could get it cleared to our Congressman Barra and Matt Sui and, and all these people, California uh, congressmen who are taking the lead back east in Washington, D.C. So we need to, uh, you know, hand out those leaflets, talk those ears, pull those ears about this issue. And yes, Elk Grove is number one school in California, but yet we need more funding in this area. As a result of that, people come to this area to seek special ed, special ed education for their children. So, but yet, you know, we don't get uh, funded correctly on that issue. So we need to toot our horns and, and go out there and pass out these leaflets and talk our talk to, to the right individuals. It's time to do that. We have control of, of the legislative body at the federal level, and I think they will listen. So Mr. now Press? is the time. Mr. Press? Yes. We mean we are an educational non-party commitment board. I didn't say it. <laughs> so no, you just need to, to watch what you say. Yeah. I just want to make you aware of your words. And yes, uh, yes I understand. Uh, yes. And I, I believe that we have the CSBA, we have the administrators, we have many people lobbying for us. And I know we have personally provided numbers to those groups to help tell our story. And you are correct. We need to continue to tell that story. I agree. And, Madam Chair. Yes. And we've been doing it to both parties, but some listen to some don't. Madam Chair, um, Mr. Bettis reminds me that it actually is a great time for a meeting of our legislative subcommittee that we set up and, you know, whatever comes out of that will will do double duty as great preparation uh, for talking points for those of us who will be able to participate in the forthcoming CSBA Legislative Action Day. Um, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, to get that, Madam Chair, on your calendar and on the superintendent. So whenever we can make that happen in the next couple of months would be great. We have, as soon as we have another board member, we will revisit committee assignments. It's on the Appreciate agenda. Appreciate it. Thank you. And then Madam President, I will like to offer to the board that we do bring the entire special ed budget for your review and approval. And we actually have to hold a public hearing on it. And within that document, it does demonstrate where the external funding sources are, how much the district contributes and in what settings. So if that's helpful or not, that is coming back to the board and um, we bring it at the same time as the LCAP and the adopted budget and everything. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the next part, Ms. Hayes and Mr. Pierce. Okay, so as we all know, another component of the governor's budget proposal is his Safe Schools for All proposal, um, which has both budgetary and programmatic implications. Um, it's important to note that this does remain a proposal. It still requires legislative support and or action. Um, at a minimum, we do suspect that the legislature is gonna make significant modifications to the proposal um, and or potentially reject it entirely. So it's difficult to discuss um, the proposal of the governor with regard to his safe schools for all and not also discuss the California Department of Public Health's um, reopening guidance. Um, that guidance now um, supersedes all previous guidance. It was issued on January 14th um, it was suspected or told to come out on January 8th, um, but we did receive that earlier this week. Um, so the, first off with regard to the proposal, 
Um, we all know the governor's calling for swift action by our lawmakers uh, to appropriate $2 billion in one-time Prop 98 funds um, to aid what he's calling the safe reopening and operation of in-person instruction. There's two windows of opportunity for this. Um, one is a February window and one is a March window. Uh, any districts that participate in a February reopening would receive $450 per ADA. Any districts that open in March under the proposal would receive $337.50 per ADA. You do receive additional grants um, similar to the LCFF calculation. Um, the, the numbers I shared with you are simply the base grants. Um, it is funded on your total ADA, not just students participating, um, absent any students that are enrolled in independent study. Um, in order for this to um, happen, of course, um, we need to know a little bit more about the legislative requirements. So um, it requires that the legislature, it was an urgency action on the governor's part, that's first and foremost. Um, being an urgency action, it requires two thirds vote um, for passage by the legislature. Um, because it's an urgency bill, it becomes effective immediately upon enactment. Um, the timeline leaves very little room or delay for LEAs interested in receiving grants under this program. Um, you'll have to start planning long before you know if the measure is going to be enacted or if the legislature modifies it, um, what the actual um, plan is going to be. We, we, there was um, a hearing yesterday in the Senate and there is this, there, we've been told that the assembly hearing on this matter will be January um, 25th. Um, I will share listening in yesterday with re, at the Senate level. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen a governor's proposal um, receive the level of feedback, um, in my words, uh, pushback, um, perhaps ever. So it's got a little ways to go. Um, and I'll share some additional thoughts and comments that we've heard um, circulating throughout the state later on in the presentation. So safe schools for all, um, what is it, what's required? Um, what you see on your slide here are really broad brush strokes of the requirements. Um, there's a lot more details kind of behind these scenes. Um, the dates that are on the slide in front of you are the February 1st window dates. Um, as I mentioned, there's also a March 1st window under the program. Um, so you can just kind of change some of those dates by a month's time. Um, it does require that TK6 and specified cohorts are offered in person um, beginning on uh, March 15th. So what's required? And you have to have a COVID-19 safety plan that has to conform with the California Department of Public Health school guidance that we received on January 14th. It also has to incorporate Cal OSHA emergency standards. Um, the governor's incentive program requires documentation of collective bargaining agreements or MOUs um, with all of your bargaining units that conform with your COVID-19 safety plan. Um, you have to offer in-person instruction by February 16th for TK through second grade and all students with disabilities, foster youth or homeless youth and any students that don't have access to technology. And then by March 15th, you have to expand to grades um, it would, be, it would be grades three through six. So by March 15th, TK through six and those specified cohorts would all be in session. If you're applying under the March window, then on March 15th, all TK through six and those cohorts would be in session. In terms of COVID-19 testing, all students and staff that are offered in-person instruction have to be tested in accordance with the CDPH testing cadence. Again, that's, on, that's in the new guidelines that came out on the 14th and I'll get into some more details about that. And then in terms of certifying technology, um, you have to verify that all students that remain in distance learning have access to software, have access to devices and high-speed internet. So more of what it is and what's required. Um, there's requirements for all LEAs, um, those that have already opened um, those who have not yet opened, and even those that don't provide TK through fifth or TK through sixth services, so um, high school districts. 
So the option for in-person instruction, if you're open, excuse me, for in-person instruction, you're still eligible to receive the grants if you meet all the conditions of the funding, including serving specified students. You have to go back and ratify your collective bargaining agreements that implement your COVID safety plan, and you have to adopt all the state's recommended testing cadences. So it wouldn't change what they're currently doing if they don't elect to participate in the program, but if they do, they still have to do all of those things. So for districts like ours um, that aren't currently providing in-person instruction, or if you're forbidden or pro uh, prohibited from opening because of local um, county health rates or case rates that exceed 25 um, cases per 100,000, you're still eligible to apply and you're still eligible to receive those grant funds. Again, you have to first meet all of the conditions and then you have to be primed and ready to open for in-person instruction immediately following the decline in the case rate threshold. So the minute you get to that uh, below 25 per 100,000, you have to be ready to open. And then, as I mentioned, even high school districts can still participate. They can still receive the funding because they would still be providing um, in-person instruction to those cohorts of students that I mentioned earlier that aren't TK through six. So a little more, again, these are broad brush strokes about what's required in your COVID safety plan details. Uh, this is where the governor's proposal um, starts to intersect with the CDPH's guidance. Um, these apply to both the reopening incentive grant program and for districts that are opening on their own under the new guidance. Um, that, by the way, as I mentioned, that new guidance supersedes all previous guidance that was issued. So right when we think we knew the rules, um, things changed on January 14th. So in terms of the safety plan itself, it's required for all LEAs before reopening for in-person instruction, again, regardless of if you're participating in the governor's reopening program. Um, you have to have the prevention program that's also required by Cal OSHA, and you have to have your supplemental um, CDPH COVID-19 school guidance checklist completed, and I'll share that with you here shortly. Um, that has a number of attachments and supplementary information um, that goes in line with that. LEAs that have already reopened must post the COVID safety plan by February 1st if they intend to stay reopened. Um, LEAs that have not yet reopened must post that plan at least five days prior to their reopening date. Um, both the governor's plan requires um, that you negotiate and that you have a ratified agreement or MOU um, the new guidance from CDPH requires that you consult with labor, parent, and community organizations in the development of the safety plan. And then LEAs, again, pursuing the reopening incentive grants must submit the collective bargaining agreements and MOUs that support the implementation of the plan either by February 1st or March 1. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. The, the, the basics here are um, the new guidance that has been released still continues to follow the tier system that we've all um, grown accustomed to. Uh, this is really the backbone of that 51 page document and the supplementary um, documents that help support it. So nothing's changed with regard to purple, red, orange, and yellow. Again, this is specific to the new guidance. Um, we don't need to spend time talking about the requirements for schools that are already reopened, but the criterion to reopen for in-person instructions for districts that have not yet reopened. So if you're located in a county that's in red, orange, or yellow, um, you can complete and post your COVID safety plan at least seven days prior to your reopening. Um, K-6 schools that are in the purple tier can also reopen if they submit their COVID safety plan to the local health officer and do not get any feedback or corrections within five days. Um, K-6 schools and counties in the purple tier with a case rate over 25 per 100,000 may not reopen for in-person instruction and schools may not reopen for grade seven, 12 if the county's in the purple tier. So in, in summary, K-6 schools can open in the purple tier if the case rate's below 25 per 100,000. 712 can only open if they're in the red tier. Uh, 
Aside from the testing program, uh, we're really in a good position to meet all of these requirements. These are requirements, again, that are in the guidance. Um, I have to put a shot out there for Tommy Amatari and Brenda McGuire and just countless other people that have put us in a good position here. So um, we have no issues with face coverings. As you know, um, we have ample inventory of those and plans in most cases. Um, I would say in all cases, they're already out there. The guidance did, did change slightly for teachers. So teachers have to actually wear a three ply surgical mask. That's new than from what we've been seeing. It's been the standard uh, procedure mask that you see many people wearing. Um, so we would have to gear up for that. Symptom and exposure screening. Um, the new guidance does not even have an active component to it or a passive component. They simply say that students it should be self-screened at home by parents and that adult staff should be self-screening themselves at home. Um, cleaning and disinfection, um, our current plans and what are built into our MOUs and what our custodial staff is doing, we're actually exceeding um, the standard in the new guidance. So we have no issues there. Um, all the information and all the documents that we've already been providing with regard to training our staff and educating our parents uh, meets the intent of the new guidance. We'd obviously want to uh, bolster that if we got to a point where we were going to reopen. Um, the missing piece again is the testing. So whereas the governor's plan requires the testing along the cadences, the CDPH's uh, reopening guidance um, doesn't require it. It's a consideration, suggestion. They use a few different um, words to describe the testing cadences. And then here, the, here they are. So student and staff testing cadences are again required under the governor's proposal suggested under the CDPH's in-person guidance. If you're in tier two or the red tier, asymptomatic testing every two weeks for all students and all staff, same with the purple tier. So there's no difference between red and purple. Um, you're simply doing asymptomatic testing of all students and staff every two weeks. If you're in the new deep purple or a case rate of 14 or more per 100,000, then you have to provide asymptomatic testing for all students and all staff on a weekly basis if you're under the governor's incentive program. Again, if you're not, these cadences are still in place in the CDPH's guidance, um, not as a requirement, but as a consideration and a suggestion. The yellow section pertains to Cal OSHA, and it defines when you must provide um, testing for um, employees in an exposed workplace. I do wanna reassure the board that we have this already in place. Um, we've had this condition occur on two occasions where we've complied with this testing, and it requires that we test any employees that were in that exposed workplace once a week until there's no positive tests over a 14 day period. So these are some of the operational challenges that districts are experiencing to reopen under the governor's plan and guidance. Um, obviously adopting the CSP and submitting it to your county office of ed or your local health department, depending on what tier you're in. Um, it does require consultation with stakeholders as well as consultation um, you'll see in the blue section with your bargaining units, um, both certificated and classified. Um, it's a really quick turnaround um, to get all of that work done by the deadlines. Um, the green section we've talked about, so we don't need to spend much time on that, but obviously adopting a COVID-19 testing plan um, that meets those requirements is very difficult. We've talked to testing labs just in interviewing them so that we could be in compliance with our OSHA requirements. Um, it's gonna be very difficult for any testing lab to meet those cadences at the volume um, that we would need as a school district, let alone what other school districts would need throughout the state. And Rob, real quick, just a note on the, on the negotiating the MOUs in the governor's proposal, it does use the term negotiate MOU. So um, what it would potentially have districts do is reopen um, or, or establish a, um, a modified MOU or a new MOU, which would actually be 
um, negotiated were in the guidance from the health department, it says consult. So you could have conversations around it, but it wouldn't be necessarily going to the point of fully reopening negotiations and then having to have that agreement and then have it ratified um, by the board. So um, this one actually does require negotiation. Good point, thanks, Chris. And then as I shared, um, you know, not stating any opinion personally or, or what we're saying as a school district, um, we just thought it would be valuable for the board to see what the legislative analyst office is saying. Um, I had this with different citations yesterday, and this changed based on the report that they released um, yesterday that was shared with the Senate. So I don't need to read these. Um, I am giving you and the community a link so that they could go back and read the report themselves if they're interested. Um, these are just examples of the general themes. So. Um, the ledge analyst office is, you know, they're, they're seeing this in the timelines as not being logistically possible. Um, they think that it's not going to lead to earlier in-person instruction than districts would otherwise do under the guidance. Um, they think the, the complex challenges that are built into the requirements are actually gonna discourage districts and or cause expenditures that far exceed uh, the grant amounts, and they question the capacity of state and local health departments um, to meet the needs of the program, as well as the capacity of testing labs to comply with the cadences. And then we just wanted to share with you um, things that we have found in different um, letters from statewide educational organizations, um, county offices of ed, and superintendents. And again, I've cited a couple of those letters below in links. Um, and this, this gets a little, quite interesting, right? So testing expenses um, should not be absorbed by Prop 98, which is for me an interesting component. It's taking money that could otherwise be in the classroom um, for school districts and applying that money to testing. Um, the proposal, according to these sources, exacerbate, um, exacerbates the educational inequities that are already in place. So what that means is districts who have the most students with need will be some of the last districts in the state that fall beneath the 25 per 100,000 case rate threshold if they get there at all this school year. Um, so too in those same districts, if they do meet that threshold, they're gonna remain in the purple tier longer and they're gonna end up spending most if not all of that incentive money on testing whereas other districts in rural areas will be able to spend that money in the classroom because they won't need to do the testing at the same rate that these students, um, these districts with high need students will. Um, and then obviously we've mentioned this a couple of times, establishing a testing program to meet the requirements within the time frame is not possible. Um, and really the big focus in a lot of this um, communication has been vaccines for educators should be the priority. Um, once we start vaccinating our teachers, they're going to feel safer um, to be in the classroom and um, testing may not be the answer, but rather vaccinations. So Mr. Hoffman and I, we also just wanted to share with you, um, you know, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. There's some good news here. So we thought it would be appropriate to share with you the current Sacramento County health indicators and that data as it pertains to our current plan of reopening. And you know, we just wanna remind people that we do have a plan in place right now to return to the classroom when we reach the red tier. So these figures are based on the January 19th update. Uh, the current adjusted case rate, meaning the seven day average case rate per 100,000 is 48.7. As a reminder, the red tier average case rate needs to be at least 7.0 or lower. Um, the seven day average positivity rate is currently at 11.4%. And again, the red tier positivity rate is 5% to 8%. Um, as you know, these figures are updated every Tuesday. So these came out Tuesday of this week. Um, it does tell a story, but not the full story. And although the numbers I shared with are certainly higher than any of us would like, um, there is good news, even with those significantly higher numbers. And we can see that here. So 
the numbers I just shared were the seven day average. So when you look at the daily averages of case rates throughout our um, county, that's been dropping significantly. So if you look at this chart here, which is again available to the public at Sacramento County Health Department's dashboard, um, the daily case rate versus the seven day average, you see it's been dropping very rapidly since January 8th. Um, this last um, well, was January 17th, which is the most updated information here. That case rate was down to 38.8. So a big drop off that we anticipate that with the holidays and the large traditional gatherings being behind us for some time, um, we hope that people are gonna continue to adhere to the county guidance and help to continue drive down our numbers. But we anticipate if those numbers follow that same trend that you're seeing there, that they're gonna drop um, substantially. Yeah, so just jump, you know, jump in here quickly. So um, not a, can't, you know, can't predict everything, but I think we're gonna see um, double digit, and this is evidence of this, you know, double digit drops in the case rate per 100,000 over the next few weeks. Uh, I think we're going to, without having to reopen negotiations with using the exact plan that we have in place, um, that we will enter the red tier this spring. It's uh, the, the worst of the, um, the pandemic from the uh, third wave and the holidays appears to be over and we're headed in that direction. Um, and we, we had the conversation with uh, labor yesterday and we'll continue to work with uh, with even more of our groups and um, I'm saying this out loud to everybody and saying it to the board uh, if these trends continue we will open this spring uh, we will we will enter the red tier and we will um, we will be able to um, start off with our pre-k3 which is our plan and then bring back uh, four six and then bring back our uh, secondary um, students and you know, having the conversations with the leadership of, uh, of the teachers group, on top of having this agreement back in October that, they, that we were ready to do this in the red tier, we now have the vaccines right here on the, you know, on the verge um, on top of that. So with the red tier and vaccines, uh, I think we're gonna be able to safely um, return our kids uh, to school, those that want to this spring. Uh, and be able to implement the concurrent model. And the huge piece beyond just the kids coming back is it's going to give us an opportunity to just like we had an opportunity to test drive uh, distance learning in the spring last year. And then what we did this fall was significantly better. If we get the opportunity to run several weeks of the concurrent model this spring, it will provide us with a great deal of information to make sure 21, 22 is the best possible year. Uh, so the light at the end of the tunnel people I'm talking about, I think it's here. Um, now, uh, this all being said, I felt really good. Actually, when I went home on Tuesday or Wednesday this week and my neighbor who always wants to know what's going on, uh, he asked me the question about, uh, well, what do you think about Super Bowl Sunday? Do you think that's gonna have a, um, an uptick? And I go, I hadn't even thought about Super Bowl Sunday, so I don't even want to think about Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, but I'm more optimistic standing here today uh, than I have been in months with regards to uh, where where it appears this is uh, this is headed, and these numbers seem to be uh, headed in that direction. So what I wanted to share here with the board. Um, what you're looking at is the um, COVID-19 school guidance checklist. This is the new requirement associated with the CDPH's um, guidance that was released on the 14th. I'm gonna try to open this, but I don't know if it's gonna play fair. And because I'm sharing my screen, um, I might have to stop and start again. Ms. Albiani, can you see that? Or are you still looking at what I was presenting before? Looking at the COVID-19, I believe, on a new screen, and now it's all disappeared, to be honest. Okay. Now I'm going to. Okay, it looks. Am I scrolling? Yes, you're scrolling. Perfect. So the checklist is, is, is not um, a huge document. The, the, 
The massive amount of work comes from all of the exhibits and the supplemental information that you're going to attach to the checklist. Um, I do want the board and the community to know that this came out again on January 14th. I want to thank a number of people that have been diligently working on this. We're, we're, we're positioning ourselves to have our checklist done and to be in a position to have everything that's required in the guidance completed. So this first page of the checklist, it's just very straightforward information about the school district, um, you know, how many grades you serve, um, your date of proposed reopening, um, your current county tier, um, your type of LEA. So straightforward information. Um, somebody's got to certify that we're posting this um, to our website. Um, that's not a problem. Um, we have to talk about our plan for stable group structures. And what that means is how we're going to keep students and staff in stable cohorts um, to keep them safe and to track when we have a situation. It is our belief that our current plan 